Wait. Did it just say recording in progress for you? Did I press something? I did. I pressed it right when you started. No, but my computer went recording in progress. Oh, I mean, I pressed it right when you admitted everybody, so. It's never done that to me before. Like, dictated. It, it, it usually uh, just asks you. It, it gives you the warning. It's like, hey, this meeting is being um, recorded. Hey, everybody. Hope all is well. Um, you're officially past halfway, I think. So that's good. It's always a plus. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the agenda here is we're gonna we're gonna split the review into two parts. We'll do all of the gross anatomy head to toe today, and we'll cover all of the bone synthesis, cartilage, the genetic stuff, all all the later physio. stuff in, in MSK, the physio. Yeah. We'll do that next weekend. We'll tentatively plan for Saturday, so we're basically splitting it in half. Do the gross anatomy today, and we'll do the the more histology micro stuff. Uh, next weekend. So I guess we're good to, <laughs> uh, all right, let's, we could go ahead and get started. I have a few housekeeping things I want to mention to you guys. How are you doing with the gross anatomy? Are you finding it hard to memorize or? It's okay. It's coming along. <laughs> okay, good. This was, it's, there's unfortunately there's no shortcut to this stuff you know we all try to you know condense our studying make it all good but with the gross anatomy you really just have to sit there and go over and over and over and over and over it and yeah it all it's so one-dimensional and that's why brady and i both endorse doing the gray's questions as early as possible because it allows you to see how it could be tested because you know they do have the lectures that say um imaging of oh crap what are they called like clinical imaging of the arm or whatever and that is very high yield but at the same time that's there it's the pathology questions are not going to be only that you have to understand all of the muscles, the innervations and stuff so that you know what can happen if something is lesioned. Yeah, for sure. Um, and another thing that I hope y'all appreciate, y'all have seen definitely the transition from FTM to MSK, like FTM was very much all over the place. As soon as you learn how to study for that, you go into this and it's a very different uh, type of studying, but at least MSK has a more of a linear focus, right? You're just one system or, you know, you know what I mean, uh, that you focus on. So going forward, it'll be even more like that. It'll get even more clinical and you're going to be basically worried about just the heart, just the kidneys and stuff. So um, I think it makes it a little bit uh, easier to organize in your mind. Um, okay, so a few things. If you've been to these reviews, you know this already. If you go to the Scrubs Facebook page, uh, bookmark the, uh, the channel playlist. It's not technically the channel, it is a playlist because the channel is private um, uh, or unpublished, you need to use the playlist link. But once you bookmark that, you'll have all of that access to all of the videos that we do. Um, what else? Uh, this is not affiliated with IEA, but if y'all do not follow IEA, this is uh, the, um, uh, the Instagram page. IEA is the Honor Society. Um, if any of you are uh, blessed enough to get above a 90, you will be able to join IEA next term. There's a lot of benefits that go into that, uh, along with tutoring and stuff like that. So follow IEA. We're going to put updates on there. Also, if you are not aware of this, download the Inkling app Y'all are going to be upset that we didn't tell y'all this sooner, but download the Inkling they app. They have time before their exam. <laughs> it's way easier to do these questions on the app than actually using the hard copy textbook. So you download that app and um, you basically, it basically. Don't worry, gives, guys. I didn't know about this until like last term. So I didn't even get to use this in my term one when I was doing MSK. So look, so you go. Um, yeah, so there's an app too, and you can go to the website, you put in your book code and you go to interactive assessment. I use my iPad. And so you could answer the questions or whatever. See, I don't even have to read the question. There you go, that's right. Um, you can just uh, do it that way. And then it tells you the answer right here underneath it. 
so you don't have to like thumb through the book. It's way easier. Way faster. I'm gonna add something to that. Sorry to cut you off. Yeah, yeah. But if you guys are going to use the website or the app, just make sure that the first few questions are going to be those first second order questions. Those questions do not start from the assigned questions. So for example, the questions that they gave us, like on our practice questions or our sheet, they start from one, but make sure when you're doing it on the website, I think the first few questions do not start from there. So you have to add those questions. You gotta start from like five or six because the first time I did that, I did that from one. And after I was done, I realized, crap, I missed whole ton of questions. So are all the all the numbers off? Like the ones they assign are not the same? Yeah, they're, yeah, they're, they're, of they're off. Yeah. They're off. Okay. I did all of them. I don't, I mean, like you can. I did not. Okay. Well, some of them are out of the scope of what you're doing, but uh i didn't feel like thumbing through it so i don't re i didn't realize that but yeah that I, that's a good point lindsay do you have that file posted that you made when you took um, all the questions out i didn't do msk because okay. there were just so many questions but for every other module in term one and term two i actually took screenshots of all the assigned questions and put them in my own document because it made me mad that i had to flip through everything and so cpr one two er dm and b all of those i have documents on my um google drive that are just the assigned questions from grace so the explanations aren't in there, but it makes it easy. If you're like me, I like to print it off because I like having a hard coffee. Coffee, oh my God, I can't talk. Um, or if you have a tablet and you want to use the tablet and go and flip through all the explanations in the back of the physical grace book. But um, I have that for everything except MSK because MSK was a lot of questions. Okay, so sorry, I didn't realize the numbering was off. That may make it a little more difficult, but I, I mean, I thought the app was... Um... A lot faster. Um, okay. Anyway, I'm on Scrubs. The slides are up there. Lindsay's dog mom. Go look at our extra resources, the additional resources. We put a bunch of extra stuff, tables, whatever we found uh, useful. So just scroll through that and see if there's anything you think is useful there that you would like to use. But I'm going to insert right here. Um, I've had a few people reach out to me um, your term last term about really nice pretty charts that they have found and been given um, that lists all of the muscles and everything about the muscles be careful because those charts while beautiful and pretty and organized they have a lot of information that is not high yield for example origin and insertion is not high yield you will not get an origin or insertion question on an sgu exam you will not um blood supply you will talk about anastomoses and Brady is going to talk about this today, but do not memorize every single artery that goes to every single muscle. If it's an anastomosis, memorize everything about that anastomosis and move on. The two big, 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 big things are going to be innervation and action and then cutaneous innervation, but that doesn't have anything to do with the muscles. Those are the two big things. If you find a nice, beautiful chart, anything else on that chart other than innervation and action, you can look over it, but don't spend your time on that. Um, so just wanna- I, I did not know it going into the exam. I promise you the insertion uh, origin stuff. Um, it's just root memorization when you're doing it like that. Uh, we've said it a million times, keep it clinical. Everything in here is clinical. You should be getting to the point when you're studying, if you're questioning whether it's high yield or not, you should ask yourself, how would they write a question about this, right? It has to be clinically relevant. And the further you go along, the, the more that'll hold steady. So um, we'll see what we, the stuff we're pointing out, the stuff we did, uh, are, are doing it's all clinically relevant okay um so if y'all did attend Keyshore's review last time we shared some of these slides but we're going to go back through them again um just because the upper limb is so um so highly tested and it is a difficult thing to learn so we'll do that kind of quickly and then goes go along 
should be doing your grades. If you notice this name right here, he's the dean of the school. So that's probably important that you use the book that the dean of the school wrote. Okay. <laughs> now, Cadaver Lab, um, Keyshore could talk on, about this. So we, we left the island during MSK, our first term a billion years ago. Um, and uh, so we didn't have this cadaver lab. Do you, do you have any advice going into that, Keyshore? I mean, they shouldn't worry about it now, but. Yeah, so there is a, a, a clean document that was compiled by a couple of upper termers um, from the past. And that document was more helpful than um, just the rote memorization and the stress of just getting through MSK. So for now, I would say just really hone in on the stuff that Brady and Lindsay are kind of giving to you guys. Um, as well as the clinical correlates that they're emphasizing. And then when the lab kind of time comes around, make sure you guys review that document because that document, essentially what you should be able to do is go through, start um, filling in the details of like innervation, um, where like if, it's, if it has an embryological origin correlate, use that. If they don't do first order questions for the lab exam. It's just like any other SGU exam it's going to be emphasized on like second order or even third order questions. So just be aware of that because a lot of us kind of went in with our open eyes and we were just like, hey, it just, we just have to identify the muscle. It wasn't the case. We needed to know the innervation and stuff. So um, we, if you guys need a little review session or something, we'll, we'll, I'll, we'll cross that bridge when, it, when we get there. But for now, there won't be any cadaver images on the, on the exam. So um, this is just, for now, just don't don't stress too much about this. You do it when we get there. All right, back and spinal cord, we'll start there. Super high yield point. Um, why don't y'all direct message us with your answers uh, and we'll go from there. All right, good. So um, if we, uh, do, 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 do. yeah, so the point here is that this cona uh, medullaris, right? The, uh, the, the cone point, uh, the bottom of the spinal cord ends about L1, L2. Uh, below that is the cauda equina, which literally means horse's tail. And the point is when you do the lumbar puncture, if you imagine stick sticking a needle through, like just through your hair, right? The hair is gonna separate. It's the same thing with the cauda equina. They're technically nerves, but they're split nerves. So when you stick the needle in there, uh, you, can, you can get CSF out, but uh, you're not gonna injure the spinal cord. If you do it around L1 or above, uh, you, you can possibly injure the patient. So point being, you wanna go L4, L5. If for some reason you can't tap it there, they, they can go up to uh, L3, L4, but you wanna be safe there. So this is for an adult. All right, and you can see that here, this is that conus medullaris and then the cauda equina, of the horse's tail down here. All right, try this one. All right, so here's the interesting thing that, that sometimes happens. Sometimes they'll give you a disease and you, you'll, you'll cover this later. I'm not sure that y'all even really talked about it. And don't freak out because in the next sentence, they tell you what you need to know about the disease, okay? So you don't necessarily need to know it. You just need to know that there's just chronic vasospasms that's happening in the cold. So if you can imagine uh, in cold weather, if you're having vasospasms or decreased blood flow, particularly to the extremities, uh, you're gonna get this ischemia, you're gonna get people complain of like uh, purple or blue nails, their lips turn purple. 
Um, so this is this Raynaud's phenomenon or Raynaud, Raynaud's disease. Um, but what they're talking about here is sympathetic fibers. Remember, you're gonna go through this again and again. The sympathetic system is about uh, fight or flight. It's about vasoconstriction primarily. Uh, in cold weather, you're gonna be vasoconstricting to keep that blood flow uh, centralized, okay? So that's what's going on here. It's, um, it's like a heightened response, okay? So this Raynaud's disease is a heightened sympathetic stimulation particularly to cold weather. So you're thinking about these sympathetic vasoconstricting fibers. Good job. All right, and then again, uh, same principle uh, when we talk about sympathetics versus parasympathetics, just remember, if, you, if you're ever confused, just remember sympathetics is running from a bear. What do you want to happen in that case versus parasympathetics is rest and digest. All right, try this one. All right, so, and I, I, I know like for the exam, y'all have more time with this, but we have, we have a lot to cover and we don't wanna keep y'all, uh, everybody pretty much dies at the two hour mark. So sometimes we go over, but our, we'll, we'll take a break, but uh, we're gonna try to keep this short and sweet. So let's see, uh, da, 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 some weakness in functioning muscles. So what they're basically asking you here, so let me just preface this. So um, uh, FTM was very much buzz heavy. MSK is a little more clinical, but there are a lot of buzzwords too, a lot of def pure definitions. When you get to CPR and onward, uh, it's a lot more clinically physiology-based. You kind of have to think through things. But here, they're basically just asking you how the dorsal primary rami works. So it's one of those things, if you didn't come across it, uh, it it's hard to know, but the dorsal primary rami, um, if, well, um, it's, it's basically going to uh, innervate those um, innermost uh, or the, um, intrinsic uh, muscles of the back, okay? The ventral primary rami is gonna do all of the muscles uh, of the anterior chest and all of the uh, superficial muscles of the back, so the bigger muscles. So I was gonna do like an axial, so if you say this is uh, dorsal and, and this is ventral and this is the spinal column, the dorsal is just basically gonna cover this area of the intrinsic back where the ventral, so if we were looking at, let's say an MRI, the ventral is gonna kind of do something like this, right? All of the anterior muscles plus those big muscles in the back. Now, I put this on here for a very specific reason. So let's say, this is kind of like um, the art of this, of taking these sorts of tests, right? So let's say you didn't know how the dorsal primary rami, you were like, I really don't know, right? And, but look at this. Let's see how we, how can we use the test to our advantage? Well, this is a, let's see. Uh, this is a big muscle, 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 right? So if we categorize this, you may be able to come across with, well, this one really stands out because it's one of those uh, intrinsic muscles of the back. So a, a lot of times it doesn't work out this way, but sometimes um, you can kind of work things out like these all fit together in one category, or maybe A and B are very similar, so neither one could be used. But this is kind of uh, one of those tricks you can use to try to work out um, answers. All right. So yeah, it's the intrinsic muscle, dorsal primary rami, do the intrinsic muscles of the back. All right, so don't be worried about the brachial plexus. Technically, you don't really need to be able to draw it out. I mean, maybe it's a cool uh, party trick or probably not actually, it's not a cool party trick unless it's a bunch of med students, but um, uh, you really need to focus on the terminal branches and stuff. So we'll get there in a second, but you can see here this dorsal primary rami uh, is gonna do these intrinsic muscles and then the larger muscle, uh, muscles of the back and the ventral muscles, the anterior muscles um, are gonna be done by the uh, ventral primary rami. So these are some of those intrinsic muscles. The ones that uh, you don't hear a lot about, uh, those are the ones that are intrinsic. Most of the time when we talk about injuries, we talk about injuries to those larger muscles. And these are some of those superficial or larger muscles here. 
and these should be familiar to you guys. But again, when you're studying this, when you look at the innervation, you want to look at what are the deficits if there's an injury there, uh, what's supposed to happen, what's not, or what's supposed to happen, or if an injury, um, what 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 would happen after an injury, right? So these are those uh, larger muscles. All right, this is straight out of your notes. So, what's this? Somebody could tell me what it is first. I think it's like sacrococcygeal. Mm -hmm. Yep, sacrococcygeal teratoma, right? When you think of teratomas, they're, they're, uh, they're classified as uh, of embryonic origin, right? So what's, what's classic about this sacrococcygeal teratoma is that um, it, it has all three germ layers. So you want to remember that. So there's kind of buzzwords that uh, that helps you differentiate different diseases. But yeah, so it has all three germ layers, meaning meaning it's of embryonic origin, right? Because eventually the germ layers split until they're uh, to they get to their more permanent cell type. So another characteristic of that is uh, it's a remnant of the primitive streak. Now again, when you talk about uh, embryology, uh, we're going to stress to you. Uh, the best way to do that is to look at the clinical uh, derivatives of it, right? So you don't need to necessarily know that the tadpole turns into a tadpole with arms, which turns into a human or whatever. Uh, you want to know that what are the deficiencies? If there's a deficiency, um, um, wh where did it happen and what was the problem? So the primitive streak is very early on in the embryo embryological process, right? So that's why all three germ layers are still there. And you could see that uh, derivatives from all three germ layers. So a lot of times teratomas can form in the uterus as well. Uh, so they, they'll take those out and you could see sometimes they have teeth and hair and stuff. So it's from germ layers. So just knowing about this sacrococcygeal teratoma, primitive streak, all three germ layers, that's what it looks like. So we'll be good to go. All right, uh, yeah, go ahead and answer this one now. I have a quick question. Yeah. Would they, uh, would, the, um, would the exam like ever test on like the very small, I mean, I feel like they would, but the small details of like how the primary umbilical vesicle, like all that stuff forms? So, like classically, it's always been uh, it's always been in in, rela in relation to deficiencies or disorders and stuff. When they talk about just the just the actual process of normal development, they really don't they really don't dive into that. It's usually like this kid's got webbed fingers. What had what was the process that was supposed to happen that prevented that? You know, and it was like, well, he they didn't undergo apoptosis. That's usually the approach they they go for. Um, just because clinically, like. Uh, knowing the normal process isn't, isn't, I mean, it's not super high yield clinically, just, w but when you see some sort of disorder, uh, it's really good to be able to say, well, this was the problem. Is there any associated problems that I should expect with this? Right. Thank you. Yep. But um, I think Lindsay had mentioned this previously, but a good trick of doing embryology is start with the end of the lecture, because that's where they do the clinical stuff. And then kind of, you know, it's a good way, of, it's a good approach to studying in general, say, this is the disorder, and then you kind of break it up into what are the problems, what's normally supposed to happen, stuff like that. But especially for embryology, because you know two thirds of the lecture is just normal development. That's just not, it's just not highly tested. All right, so you need to know all of these. We'll go through them. So point being spinal cord and meninges, that sounds bad, right? You don't want um, that bulging out of your lower back. So in general, the long, longer the word, the worse it is, right? So Milo correlates to the cord, meningio is the meninges, seal is the actual outpouching of it. Spina bifida occulta usually is asymptomatic. They diagnose these kids. There's like a little tuft of hair, they say, uh, on the back. Um, uh, and meningio seal will obviously be the same as Milo meningio seal, except you won't have the spinal cord in there. You'll just have meninges, okay? So you definitely need to know uh, these. What's the other one that doesn't have anything? Anybody? Menin. It's like completely open. Didn't y'all cover Rakitis. that? Rakitis. Uh, Milo Skeesis. That's it. Yeah, the Skeesis one. That's really bad, right? Because you don't have a covering. Seal means there's a covering. But Milo Skeesis is the one 
but um, they do like to test on this, these differences here, because it's fairly common. And what is the deficiency in the mother that tends to lead to this? Folate. Folic acid, very good, or folate, same thing. Yeah, there it is, good. Right, and you can see that here. This is that little tuft of hair. You see that the uh, vertebral uh, arches here didn't form <clears throat> to make the complete vertebral body, but there's a little tuft of hair. Meningioceles there. Um, <clears throat> Meningeomyelocele or myelomeningeocele, same thing. You can see that the spinal cord is there. And then here it is, myeloschisis. Yeah, so it's a complete opening. So that's very bad, obviously, uh, a conduit for infection. Now, the sooner you learn the neural crest cells uh, and the derivatives, the better. They're kind of a little all over the place, but they tend to be neurologic of origin. We all we have this running joke that if they ever put neural crest cells in the answer choices, it's always the answer. Uh, that's not necessarily true, but it is. So just, it's like uh, one of those things they like to test on it and it'll come up again and again. Some of the GI disorders and stuff like that uh, correlate to failure of migration of these neural crest cells. So keep these in mind, neural tube derivatives tend to be uh, CNS, there are some PNS ones, and then these cre neural crest derivatives uh, are a little all over the place. There's more than this, but this is all you need to know for right now. If you want the full list, you can go look at first aid. All right, try this one. Um, all right, so what are we talking about? Um, now we have an anterior dislocation, right? So if we just had a fracture, we would be talking about spondylolysis, but because there's a uh, anterior dislocation, uh, it's spondylolithesis, uh, I think is how you properly pronounce it, spondylolithesis. So you can say, and I don't think they'll do this for you on the test, Technically, you can have an anterior displacement without a fracture, but especially in the lumbar area, like you're not going to see this anterior displacement without a fracture, right? Sometimes they'll have this spondylolisthesis uh, in the cervical area that doesn't have a fracture, but like that's like more advanced than we need to worry about. So this anterior displacement is going to be um, what you're looking at. So simply put, don't like confuse this. Uh, if they have a fracture on the test with no anterior displacement, put spondylolysis. If they talk about an anterior displacement, regardless if there's a fracture or not, put spondylolithesis. I know sometimes they put like both of them together and stuff. Uh, they make it more confusing than it needs to be. Um, but um, if there is anterior displacement, put spondylolithesis. That's it. All right. So they talk about this oblique view where you see this Scotty dog appearance, right? Here's the head. Here's the neck or the, the collar. Uh, this fracture, does anybody know what this is called? Uh, what is the weak point? It's not on the page, I don't think so. Cars, cars inter, I think. Inter cars what? Articularis. There yeah. it is. <laughs> Very good, yeah. Pars interarticularis, right? That is the weak point when you get the, these fractures, compression fractures or some sort of uh, 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 trauma to this area, you fracture the pars interarticularis. Very important point because uh, that's gonna be the spondylolysis and that will be that anterior displacement. Now keep in mind the anterior displacement is of the superior vertebrae, okay? So this is what you'll expect. Uh, if you were doing this on the test or if you were a radiologist, uh, you could kind of do like this and say, well, it's supposed to go down like this it doesn't, it makes this right angle. So obviously there's a problem, okay? And see, so um, I doubt they would give y'all anything like this, but obviously if you trace these down, it doesn't look like there's any sort of uh, anterior displacement here. Um, this is obviously the front of the patient and you can see these, uh, these spines in the back. Uh, that's the back of the patient, here's the hip. So we're looking at the, the, uh, the lumbar area, but you don't see any displacement. Everything lines up, so this is just spondylolysis. And then here, if you were to trace it down, this is the front of the patient over here. You see the spines in the back. Um, 
L4, you see the slip, or well, not slip disc. I don't want to say that. That's a different thing. But you see this anterior displacement of the vertebrae. Um, I don't know if did y'all cover uh, MRIs yet with like uh, M1 or T1 and T2 two weighted? Y'all did? Okay, yes. good. Does somebody want to tell me what this is? Does it say it somewhere? Because there's a trick to doing these. Yeah, it's T2. So the problem is that, okay, so T1 is uh, fat and T2 is fluid, right? So there's a problem because in, in fat, there's a lot of fluid. So it tends to light up anyway. So the trick into looking at these is you need to find an area of fluid where there's no fat. Perfect area is the, uh, the spinal cord, or the spinal column where you have uh, CSF. So if the CSF lights up, then you know it's T2, right? Whereas this, you say, well, look at the fat lighting up. Well, that's because there's a lot of fluid in the fat. So the idea here is you want to find an area of fluid that doesn't have fat. So I always look at that. And you could see the, uh, the caudal equina kind of diving down in here, right? And then the conus medullaris is right about here. So, Brady, nice I was wondering time. if I could just quickly ask, so in spondyl spondylolisthesis, does that mean that the neck always gets fractured of the dog? Yeah, from my understanding, I mean, it, there, there could be rare cases, but from my understa understanding and all you need to know is that, yeah, there's a fracture of this pars interarticularis that causes that anterior slip. Um, technically, you could get a slipping uh, like this without the fracture. It tends to be cervical, but in, in the cases where y'all, uh, when y'all uh, talk about it, it'll be straightforward. If they say anterior displacement, it's going to be the prosthesis. Okay, thank you. All right, let's try this one. That's right, Kishore. I'm agree again. I call Kishore in the middle of the night and ask him fourth order questions just because. Getting them ready for those rotations. <laughs> All right, um, cool. So dens, right? Remember the dens? So there's the atlas, which is C1, right? Atlas meaning like a circle. And there's the axis, right? C2, which is where the dens is. And it's gonna, this atlas is gonna revolve around the axis, right? So the dens is that little, uh, protrusion that, that protrudes superiorly that kind of helps the, the head to move, um, uh, you know, along that axis for lack of a better term. So what are we talking about? Well, this is that transverse ligament of the atlas. That's what the ligament that actually holds uh, the axis uh, against or the dens against the atlas, right? The dens of the axis against the atlas. So if this ruptures uh, in some sort of injury, tends to be a, a MVA, a motor vehicle accident, um, you can get a lot of problems here. Now, if you look here, what I want to point out is that this is the worst one, this type two. So if you want to know one, you want to know type two. I'm sorry, if you want to know one of these, you wanna know it's the type two one. That's the bad one. The reason being is that that transverse ligament crosses right where that fracture is. And if it presses down at that point, um, you can get avascular necrosis because there's some smaller vessels that supply blood to the dens. So if you can, fr if you fracture it there, um, a lot of times uh, you, you get um, decreased blood flow or avascular necrosis to the, the, to the tip, just the tip though. Um, and then, but that uh, the, 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 um, the vessels are pretty much protected in these situations. It's just that it runs right there. All right, let's try this one. Super, yeah, this is a really important thing, but we'll break this down for you guys. Right, so y'all have been doing your grace questions. Good, so basically we're just asking what uh, nerve is compromised at this point if you have some sort of herniation at L4, L5? Well, we know if we're in the lumbar regions, it's the lower of the two. So let's break this down. 
now. So we'll start with the cervical region. So let's just take C1, 2, 3, 4, and C5. So now the C5 nerve is going to be what exits here. So C1 is going to be above the nerve is going to be, let me do this. So C1, C2, C3, C4, and C5, right? So the, the nerve actually starts above the vertebrae in this region, right? So if you have some sort of herniated disc like right here, it's gonna come and it's gonna injure C5, okay? Cool, so in the cervical region, it's the lower nerve that's gonna be injured. Now, if we look here, what ends up happening is you have a C7 nerve, or I'm sorry, C8, yeah, C8 nerve, which is extra because you only have seven cervical vertebrae. So, you, but you have eight nerves. What that does is it bumps all the nerves down one. So now T1 nerve is below the T1 vertebrae. So because there's an extra a C8 nerve and there's only seven cervical vertebrae, that eighth nerve is gonna pump, is gonna push everything down one. So now the nerve is gonna exit below the vertebrae, okay? So, whoops. What you see here is that the uh, uh, nerve above, the, the T7 nerve is gonna come out before, okay? So in the cervical region, it's the lower of the two. In the um, thoracic region, you can see because we bumped it down, it'll be the nerve that's above. But the one they like to talk about most is the lumbar region because that has the most, um, the most force against it, right? The most pressure, it's the lower of the nerve, uh, of the vertebrae. Um, so you can see here, uh, so herniations tend to happen here because there's a lot of pressure there. So when it ends up happening is the nerve will still exit below, okay? Um, but the, uh, it'll, it exits above the disc, right? So T4 is still gonna exit below the, I'm sorry, the, the nerve for L4 is still gonna exit below the disc, but it's safe because, um, it, it, I'm sorry, the L4 nerve is gonna exit below the L4 vertebrae, but it's going to be safe because it exits above the disc. In the previous cases, the disc is above the nerve in that little space, so that nerve will hit it. But in this situation, the nerve is very uh, is very su is superior to the actual disc. So even though L four comes out, <clears throat> um, it's safe because the disc is below it. So what you actually see is that this L five, which actually comes between uh, L five and uh, S one. Um, L5, yeah, right. So that this is gonna be the one that's compromised, okay? Because the nerve exits before, okay? So on the test, you don't wanna to have to think about any of that. So just remember this, that if it's if it's cervical, C2 and C3, you the one that's injured is gonna be the lower one. If it is thoracic, T4 and T5, it's gonna be the upper one. And if it's L4 and L5, they'll probably ask you where the injury is, it's the lower one. So lower, upper, lower. But it's just tricky because in that lumbar region, uh, the nerve's gonna exit above the disc. So it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be injured, okay? Hope that made sense. <clears throat> All right, and you can see that here. So right, so look, this is the L4 vertebrae, this is L5 vertebrae. So L4 technically still goes below it, but look at the disc, the disc is below where the nerve exits. So this nerve is not gonna be pinched or compromised. You're gonna get the one that goes below it, the L5 nerve that's compromised. All right, upper limb, let's do this one.
All right. So what you need to remember here is that the clavicle is usually what separates, okay? So if you get a separation of the clavicle, you have two, um, two tendons that help to, or ligaments that bone to bone, so it's a ligament, uh, ligaments that attach there. So let's take a look at this. You could see the, um, the core coclavicular, right? The, um, the clavicle, and you could see here where it attaches. So that's gonna separate. And then you have the acromioclavicular uh, as well. Um, and that can separate as well. But anything with cl clavicle in it is going to be what separates. Um, the ones that uh, attach the acromion to the, um, to the, uh, the chrome, to the core, co what is this called? The core cord pro process, is that right? Coracoid process to the chromium, those are stable, okay? The ones that attach to the clavicle are the ones that tend to separate. So you can see very clearly here that the, the, the clavicle is supposed to attach to the chromium. This is very much separated. But when you get that injury uh, secondarily, you also get this coracoclavicular injury as well. The reason that the clavicle is pulled upward or superiorly, y'all will get to this a little later, is because it attaches to that sternocleidomastoid, that muscle uh, that attaches to your neck. So when you get separation here, that muscle in your neck tends to pull it upwards. Okay, so don't get bogged down with this. Um, there is a video if you do want to learn how to draw it out. It's like go on YouTube and search like um, draw the brachial plexus in 30 seconds and they show you a trick to do it. But the most important thing you wanna to wanna to remember is the terminal branches. What are the clinical correlations to if there's an injury uh, to these terminal branches? The uh, mnemonic to remember this from roots to branches is real Texan drink cold beer, roots, trunks, division, uh, cords and branches. But again, like I said, the terminal branches are gonna be what's mostly tested on. When y'all get to the uh, the uh, cadaver exam, uh, you're gonna wanna be able to kind of identify, you wanna be able to find this M. This M is very important, um, but you'll, we'll get there. When, when you get there, we'll talk about it, but it has to do with uh, the terminal branches and how you identify it on a cadaver. But for now, you wanna worry about the clinical stuff. So let's, let's do this one. Did Lindsay leave me? Where'd she go? Oh. I think she had some connectivity issues. So she oh. she said she'll join okay. us in a no bit. Worries. I'll keep you company, Brady. Okay. She's got some, I'm tired of hearing Brady talk issues. That's what it is. <laughs> she wanted to break. Yeah. I heard that, Brady. Damn it. <laughs> I'm changing locations because I was dogs. No worries. All right. So, oh, does it say in here? What does this child have? What is this called? Yeah, herbs palsy or, or herb Duchenne palsy. What is this position called? This is a great way to uh, know this. Does anybody know what they call this? The waiter's tip, right? So if you think about <clears throat> like a waiter leaving the table and he's like, yo, throw me a couple extra bucks. Like he puts his hand out like this, but this helps me to remember what's going wrong, right? So I like as you, you know, a good way of learning things is to chunk the information. So this is gonna be an injury to the upper brachial plexus, upper trunk. When we talk about Klumpke's palsy, that's gonna be a lower trunk injury, okay? So you wanna kind of keep those together. I have slides coming up. But what, I, what the, the, the classic way that they'll present this is a difficult vaginal delivery. And when you have a difficult vaginal delivery, sometimes a child's head is, is hyper, hyper, hyper lateralized or hyper flex, whatever. It, it gets, uh, it, and you tear the upper brachial plexus, right? You can imagine if you, if you stretch this way, this upper brachial plexus is stretched. Okay, so when you do that, um, you tend to get injury to the, oh, 
Sorry, Let, we'll do this one first and then we'll talk about the muscles. So think about the waiter's tip position here and then we'll kind of go through it. So the arm is adducted, ADD, right? So here's a trick. Um, if, you, if you, so adducted versus abducted. Like ADD, the Ds are closer together. So the arms closer together, we're abducted, they're further apart. So it's, it's up, I don't know if that helps, but yeah. So adducted or abducted. So the child's arm is adducted, it is medially rotated and the wrist is flexed, right? And that's that waiter's tip position. So you have to be careful in the exam because they could either ask you in the question, I could write the same question and say, um, how should, how, like, what is the deficit, right? Or is that what they said? Okay. Uh, Okay, so they're, they're asking you what the deficit is here. They could, they could very easily switch it and say, how should it be, right? And so the arm, um, you know, so they could say, you, there's an inability to laterally rotate the arm, or the answer could be like, the arm is medially rotated. So they could, could either ask you, how does the child present in this clinical scenario, or what is the deficit, right? So they're completely opposite. Even, you know, the child cannot laterally rotate the arm is the same thing as saying the arm is medially rotated. So watch how they ask the question. I know in sometimes in stressful situations, uh, those are the little things, because they will put them both as answer choices, right? Um, so you just don't want to get uh, little things like that confused. But yeah, so these are the muscles that we talk about with this waiter's tip position, the suprascapular nerve, right? That's going to help you to ab abduct, right? Abduct the arm. Axillary nerve as well, right? Musculocutaneous nerve. So that's why the, uh, the arm is uh, medially rotated, um, adducted, and the, the wrist is uh, mildly flexed. So these are the primary muscles that are affected. Now, when you talk about Klumpke's palsy, very similar in its, uh, in its how, how the deficit or the trauma occurs, except it's the lower brachial plexus. So the, the clinical situation they give you here, let me see if I have a question. Um, the clinical situation they give you for Klumpke's palsy is somebody was in a tree and they fell out of the tree and they tried to grab onto the tree and um, you know it stretched. So whereas in Herb Duchenne's palsy, you injured the upper brachial plexus, this time you stretched the lower brachial plexus and tore it. So the clinical uh, scenario here, if you tear the lower brachial plexus is you get what's called Klumpke's paw. So you're tearing uh, the, the roots of the nerves for like the, um, the ulnar nerve, the median nerve, and you see these downstream effects, okay? And that's gonna get the Klumpke's paw. But it's very similar. It's just Herb Duchenne's upper, Klumpke's palsy is lower. You could see that here. These are the three that are primarily injured that we talked about, right? So you can't initiate abduction, uh, uh, axillary, you can't continue it up to 90 and then forearm flexion and weakened forearm supination has to do with the muscular cutaneous. Um, they do like asking these, uh, these, um, these angles, right? What is the one? Okay, so we have two. So suprascapular is zero to 15, axillary is uh, to 90 degrees. What's the one that goes over your head or two that go over your head? Serratus anterior and trapezius. Yeah, right, good. So they'll, they will ask you that. So watch the angles on that, very good. All right, and you can see that here, look, he's in a waiter's tip position. So you stretch this ipsilateral uh, upper brachial plexus and um, now the arm is compromised, okay? This is great. If y'all haven't seen this, this is wonderful. This helps you to determine when you're looking at the brachial plexus, what are the downstream problems? So um, label your fingers. C5 through T1, right? That's all of the uh, roots of the, um, are the, uh, yeah, the roots, well, right, yeah, roots of the uh, brachial plexus. So if you do three musketeers, that's the first three, that's uh, musculocutaneous, right? So, so if you have a C5, C6, or C7 injury, you're going to affect the musculocutaneous. Because when you look at the brachial plexus and all the roads kind of come together, this is how it breaks down very simply. C5 through C7 is musculocutaneous. Assassinated, 
C5 and C6 has to do with uh, axillary um, radial is rats. Uh, that's all of them, right? So when it all comes together, you can see that mice as well is median nerve and ulnar C8 and T1. So let's look at this practically, right? So if we have a Arbdurshan palsy, we're affecting the upper brachial plexus, C5, C6, maybe also C7. So we see musculocutaneous is compromised, axillary is compromised. Um, we actually do have some injuries here, but they don't talk about them as uh, intensely as the uh, musculocutaneous as well. Uh, um, and the axillary and then what was the third one we talked about? Uh, suprascapular, right? So that comes off of the first branch. I'm sorry, the first root. Um, so that's what's injured, but you could see they have also minor injuries here. Now, what if we looked at Klumpke's palsy? We're primarily affecting the lower brachial plexus. So look what we have affected. Are we gonna affect musculocutaneous and axillary? Not likely, that's coming off the upper brachial plexus, but as for the radial, uh, the median and the ulnar, those are affected. And what are the complications if you affect these? C8, T1, what are they? They're downstream effects. You're gonna see it in the hand and that's how you get Klumpke's palsy, okay? So easy points on the test, just keep these separated. Print this out if you must, draw on yourself, no judgment here. All right, again, Klumpke's palsy, what is the clinical scenario they'll talk about? Some dudes hanging in a tree, he falls out, he tries to grab on tears the lower brachial plexus, these aren't elevated. All right, now, uh, again, knowing these is good in regards like, like straightforward, the grace questions will help. Um, some of the ones they like, they love serratus anterior long thoracic, that wing scapula that you get uh, if you press against the wall. You know how they, you know they love it because there's like 20 questions and Gray is asking the same thing. There you go. So the more questions and Gray's they have, the more, the dean of the school likes it because he wrote the book. All right, use it to your advantage. Then, so that's one. Um, these aren't super important. If you want to know them, uh, again, not super important clinically, right? How are you? You know, they do like actually they do like the rachidorsal and latissimus dorsi because it's such a big muscle in your back. But some of these are very small. It's great if you could draw them out, but not super high yield. Again, what we were saying, this is that M formation that we see. So when you look at a cadaver, I'll just tell y'all now, the idea is to find where the musculocutaneous dives into the muscle. If you see the point where it dives into the muscle, you could trace the M back and then you could see that, then you could find the radial that goes underneath it, okay? Not too high yield right now, but when you look at the cadavers, that's gonna be your goal. When you're looking at the uh, brachial plexus, find the M, because what are they gonna wanna ask about? These branches, why? Because those are what's gonna, gonna that's what's gonna give you the problems, okay? Marmu, that's how you remember it, musculocutaneous, axillary, radial, median, ulnar, marmu, okay? Um, again, I put this like five times because it's good to know. All right, some good buzzwords. These are easy points on the test. If you have uh, uh, an injury to the surgical neck of the humerus, right? Humerus, bone right here. Surgical neck, you're gonna affect the axillary nerve, okay? What kind of symptoms are you gonna get with that? Well, we already said axillary does 15 to 90, right? Because it uh, innervates the deltoid. But also they, they, they like to talk about this, this um, sergeant's patch, this where you get decreased sensation over the sergeant's patch. So if you think of the military, they have a sergeant's patch right here. You get decreased sensation over the latter part of your arm. That's, that sensation's innervated by the deltoid. So superficial muscles from the axillary, it's not the deltoid, the axillary. Also what you injure, Posterior circumflex humoral artery. <clears throat> the reason is that the, the anterior and posterior circumflex go around the humerus. So if you rip the humerus out, the only way that, well, the most likely way the humerus is gonna come out is anteriorly, right? Because the scapula is in the back. So if you pull it out this way and you have the circumflex artery around the humerus, you're gonna rip it, right? Because it encircles it. So you wanna remember surgical neck injuries, dislocations, um, uh, stuff like that is typically gonna be um, axillary nerve, and if they ask the artery, posterior cir uh, circumflex humoral, right? It just tears it when it, when it uh, anteriorly dislocates. More importantly, they love mid-shaft mid fractures. The radial nerve dives deep when it travels down along the humerus. It dives, it goes uh, very close to the actual bone. Uh, so in the sense it's protected, 
but it's also going to be compromised when you talk about mid shaft fractures. So anytime you get a mid shaft fracture, you're worried about radial nerve injuries. And we'll look at a question in a second talking about that. The artery that goes with it is the deep brachial artery. Nerves are going to be more important in this sense, but it is good to have an artery that goes with it. All right. Let's do this one. This is a good one. Okay. Now, they like this question because it's a little, you don't have the last one in the PowerPoint. Yeah, I'll go back to it in a second. Um, it's a little tricky here because if you just think about it, here we go. The guy's unable to extend the wrist, fingers, and thumb. All right, so distal. We know extension has to do with the radial nerve, but he can extend the elbow. So what it seems to be is that extension above the elbow is okay. So what is the answer? Radial nerve mid humerus. Now, if you think about that, well, the tricep is extension and it's gonna be up in this area. How is the tricep not compromised? And the reason being is that the branch that goes to the tricep artery, I'm sorry, to the tricep muscle, the branch of the radial nerve that goes to the tricep, uh, it comes off before the midpoint in the humerus, okay? So, even if you have a, um, a mid-humoral fracture, the triceps will not be affected, okay? They like to put this on here because um, if you're just going to the elbow, you may think that the tricep would be compromised, but that branch comes off before the midpoint of the humerus, okay? So the tricep is gonna be intact. So the only uh, symptoms you're gonna see are gonna be distal, wrist, fingers, thumb. The elbow is gonna be okay, again, because um, because the, the triceps is gonna be, uh, the branch of the triceps comes off before the midpoint. Why can't it be A? So you always wanna go with the, the most proximal point. Okay, so an A, A, A is dealing with uh, flexion primarily. We're looking at extension here. Extension is gonna be uh, radial. Median is gonna mostly do flexion. All right. So just one of those tricks, just remember that the, the triceps goes off uh, beforehand. What is, what, what was the, uh, no, you don't have the, I put the, I made these slides. Yeah, some of these. So um, this mid shaft, yeah. So you, you all these slides are posted. Y'all can go get these um, <clears throat> in, um, they're in my PowerPoint though, right? Yeah, okay, yeah, well, they have to be, I'm using them, all right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so you can download these on the scrubs page. So, yeah. Uh, yes, Charlie, can you say hi? Sweet. Oh, she's Phoebe sleeping on the floor over there. All right. So again, before the mid shaft, just a question they really like to test. Extension of the upper arm is intact. All right. <clears throat> Another buzzword you need to know: supracondylar. That's down here. If you have a supracondylar fracture. Thanks, Kishore. If you have a supracondylar fracture, you're going to be uh, affecting the median nerve. So <clears throat> when you talk about median nerve injury, you're talking about this part, we'll get to the hand in a little bit. So you're going to have problems with flexion. <clears throat> Medial epicondyle, another buzzword for you, you can see here. So um, this is the right arm, um, the medial epicondyle, any sort of injury there. Um, you're going to have injury to the ulnar nerve. That's the medial epicondyle. That's right around the area where you, um, you hit your funny bone. If you hit your funny bone, you think about it, the sensory innervation. Uh, next time you do, um, you'll feel it. You'll feel numbness on this finger and literally half of this finger, right? So you can rub on both sides of this and you feel it on one side and not the other. So if you can't remember on a test, just hit your funny bone 
and um, you'll remember. All right, this is from first aid. You could kind of see the sensory innervation here um, where it goes, uh, good to know, especially in the hand, they like to test this. So radial nerve and the ulnar nerve, you're chopping, right? So the uh, medial aspect of the hand. All right, they like this question too. Try this one. Cool. So yeah, um, there's really, this is like the only way they can ask this question, right? Because like this, this injury primarily, so to my knowledge, only happens in kids. They talk about parents swinging their child. Um, so this ligament is lax, right? So if we look at the picture, the ligament is lax. Um, and so the, the head of the radius can slip out, right? It's really painful at the time. But if you, as soon as they, they uh, set it back in place, the pain goes away. Okay, so this is just uh, a common injury that happens in kids because their their um, the ligaments and their bones aren't fully formed. So it's called nursemaid's elbow, um, but definitely know that in context of, of the kid, right? All right, so just a couple of buzzwords to remember. The radius is gonna attach to the uh, capitulum. The ulna is gonna attach to the trochlea. Now, when we look at these, when we're looking at the elbow, remember at the elbow, the ulna, is gonna be larger than the radius, okay? The radius is gonna be smaller. As we move to the wrist, the radius is gonna be the bigger bone and the ulna is the smaller bone, right? Okay, so when you're looking at the wrist, the ulna is larger, radius is smaller. When we get to the, uh, the wrist, this is at the elbow. Sorry, I don't know if I said that wrong. At the elbow, the ulna is larger, radius is smaller. At the wrist, the radius is larger and the ulna is smaller. But we'll look at the wrist in a second. All right, these are just a couple of tricky things that I came across. Um, this kind of makes sense. The median nerve is gonna uh, turn into, because it's on the anterior side, it's gonna turn into the anterior interosseous nerve. Radial nerve being on the posterior side, change into the posterior interosseous nerve. So they could put these on, on the question stem and you need to be able to correlate which goes with which. What gets tricky is the ulnar artery technically splits into the anterior interosseous and posterior interosseous arteries, okay? So just be sure you get, can keep these straight in your head. All right, let's do some hand stuff. And kudos to y'all because this is very difficult doing this um, without actual cadavers in front of you. Um, without being able to do, you know, doing this in two dimensions in a book is not ideal. So um, we feel you, we were there too. Lindsay loves to draw on herself. All right, she's gonna point it out, yeah. Hey, I've had so many people message me after the fact saying that was some really good advice. And I have so many people in my term that like, yeah, I did that too. It never works. It doesn't choose. Yeah. You just have to make sure that you get it off before the exam or they'll think you're cheating. <laughs> All right. So point here is that we're looking at the fourth and fifth digits, right? And you'll see that the fourth and fifth digits are innervated by the ulnar nerve and they come off that area of the flexor digitorum profundus. So this is another tricky concept that we wanna look at. Uh, the flexor digitorum profundus is a tricky muscle, which is why they like to test on it. It actually is duly innervated. So half of it's gonna be innervated by the uh, ulnar nerve and the other half by the median nerve. So the medial one half, Remember, we're in anatomical position. So the medial one half is gonna be the fourth and fifth digits. It's gonna be innervated by the ulnar nerve. Whereas the lateral half, right, is gonna be digits two and three are gonna be innervated by the median nerve. And as we look, as I saw before the anterior interosseous branch, okay? So it's just one of those weird things. Uh, for whatever reason, it has two heads or two bellies and it splits. So meaning that's a good testing point for them because they can ask you one, 
and it's half of the, the muscle. So this is how it breaks down. If you look at the flexor digitorum profundus, you could see that the ulnar digits four and five, which are the median medial side, are innervated by the ulnar nerve. And the lateral side, digits two and three, are gonna be from the median nerve. No, they, they attach to the distal phalanx, okay? Flexor digitorum profundus, distal phalanx has the split, right? Two bellies. Now, if you look at the flexor digitorum superficialis, it's gonna attach, different muscle attaches to the proximal phalanx. Now, all of these uh, are gonna be, this whole muscle is gonna be innervated by the median nerve, okay? So we could just go back and forth. You can see an injury to the median nerve will be worse than an injury to the ulnar nerve. Why? Because there's six points of flexion here that would be affected if you injure the median nerve where just two are affected in the ulnar nerve, right? So let's go back to the question. Inability to flex the DIP joint of the fourth and fifth digit. So if we look here, this is the DIP fourth and fifth digit, right? So how would it look if you had a median nerve injury? Well, not only would you not be able to flex the second and third digit of the DIP, you wouldn't be able to flex any of the, uh, the, the, the joints um, <clears throat> at the PIP joint, right? The proximal phalanx, okay? So they like to test on that. Um, be sure to have that straight in your head. All right, carpal bones, everybody's favorite. What's interesting here, um, is that the ulna doesn't actually attach to any of these carpal bones. The ulna is wrapped around the radius. The radius is what attaches to all these bones. So there is no actual um, correlation between the ulna and the carpal bones. Like I said, there's this, uh, there's, a, there's a, a ligament that connects the radius and ulna together, but all of these bones technically attach to the radius. So if you were looking at this, the trick here is if you can find the thumb, you could see that if for some reason they don't show the thumb, remember we said earlier, at the wrist, the radius is gonna be larger than the ulna. At the elbow, the, the ulna is larger. At the wrist, the radius is larger. So you could find the radius, right? And then you orient yourself, thumb radius. Now you can organize the bones. So this is how we do this. We go proximal thumb side. That's where we're gonna start. Proximal, right, thumb side, scaphoid lunate, triquirium pisiform. Then we go back, thumb side, and do distal, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, hamate. So you read it left to right, okay? But you wanna find the radius first, thumb side, and read it. The reason we do this, because we have this great mnemonic, the dirtier, the better. Some lovers try positions that they can't handle. Everybody remembers that. Um, so that's how you do it. Now, in testing purposes, unless they give you some sort of first order question and just point to one of the bones, they're gonna talk about two of these primarily and I have questions here for you. So try this one. Yeah, exactly. So we're talking about a fracture here. So typically you fall on your outstretched hand, the bone that's most likely fractured is gonna be the scaphoid. And you could see that here. So let's orient ourselves. Which bone is bigger? This one, this is the radius, right? So radius is always thumb side, right? Always gotta be on the thumb side. So you know the thumbs over here somewhere. So you see this, it kind of looks like a peanut. Once you see the peanut, can't go back, right? So you see the fracture here. Now, the, the problem with this is that the radial artery runs right around here. So it's, it's not, it, it may not initially be in the ER if you get this scanned, get an x-ray, it may not be uh, easily detected. But if you injure the radial artery, you can get avascular necrosis to the, the distal aspect of the, uh, the thumb side of the scaffold, right? Because it runs right there. So you could injure the uh, radial artery. So ideally you can get some sort of MRI to make sure that uh, that's uh, not compromised. Um, but yeah, so fractured, we're talking about the scaphoid, okay? Now, different, well, same question, but we're talking about a dislocation. Which one is most commonly dislocated? Yeah. 
Good, yeah, y'all got this, right? So lunate, uh, typically it's dislocated um, um, uh, posteriorly, right? Because of just the, just the way it's, um, the bones are organized, it kind of pops out toward the back, right? So lunate is gonna be dislocation, posterior dislocation. All right, um, let's try this one and we'll go through these. All right, good. So the key thing for these Smith's versus Collie's fracture, I want you to focus on is where is the position of the distal fragment, okay? So what are we talking about? The distal fragment of the radius is angled forward or anteriorly. So you always define the fracture by the distal fragment. So if you were in clinicals rotations, you would say, there is an anterior dislocation of the distal fragment of the radius and immediately, the attending would tell you that's a Smith's fracture or ask you if that, what kind of fracture that is. So let's break this down. So um, posterior fracture. So we're talking about the distal part. So the distal radius in the hand technically, right? So if we have a, it, so we see the radius here, the fracture, the distal part is posteriorly, um, is posteriorly uh, displaced, right? So a posterior fracture, meaning the distal fragment fractures posteriorly. This is the distal fragment. It's going posterior to the radius. Um, so let's, let's look at this uh, on an x-ray. If we find our radius here, you can see that this hand is posterior displaced. So you find a thumb. So the hand's down like this, right? The palm's down. And you can see that the distal fragment is posteriorly displaced, okay? So that's a Collie's fracture. Now, if we look here, find our distal fragment, our palm's down, right? So palm is always anterior. So this is an anterior displacement. The distal fragment is displaced anteriorly, right? Anterior displacement. So we're looking at a Smith's fracture. So again, find your thumb here. So the palm's facing to this side, to the right. And you can see here that this is displaced anteriorly. This one's not as obvious as just one I found on the internet. But um, technically, if you looked at this, you would say this hand is uh, displaced anteriorly. You, they wouldn't give you something like this. This is more difficult to, to tell. But they'll probably just give you uh, just a scenario, right? But you're always worried about the distal fragment. All right, that's my dog snoring. She does not care about this, so. All right, this is a good, good one too. Phoebe, come see. Now she's mad. All right. Come here. No. Mm -mm. Yeah, this is like this is a definitely a tricky question. So um it takes like two concepts in one. Uh, all right, so let's break this down now. Anterior, so you have an injury to the anterior surface of the wrist. So we're affecting a nerve anterior surface. What two nerves travel on the anterior surface that we're worried about? The median and the ulnar, right? Now, how do we determine which one's which? The cut is down the, the surface of the flexor retinaculum, but not into it. They're not telling you that for fun. They're trying to differentiate the two. Remember that the median nerve travels beneath the flexor retinaculum, okay? The flexor retinaculum is like a watch band, right? Um, it doesn't really, uh, it, you know, it doesn't really stretch, right? So that's why 
the median nerve that travels underneath it, you get carpal tunnel. So if you overuse your, your, uh, your hand muscles, if you're typing or writing or whatever, um, you get the tendons will swell and the flexor retinaculum doesn't really expand. So it'll, it'll pinch or uh, compress the median nerve that travels underneath it. Now, the question is saying that we didn't, we didn't cut into the flexor retinaculum. So that means the median nerve could not have been affected. So we must be talking about the ulnar nerve. So that's the first step, right? Then we have to determine, well, which of these involves the ulnar nerve? And I put this one here for a reason because it's not that obvious. So first off, yes, median nerve is not affected not into it, right? But what is not intuitive is that the media, I'm sorry, the ulnar nerve actually helps with adduction of the thumb. So the ulnar nerve, even though it comes off on this medial aspect of your hand, it does have a branch that comes off that helps with adduction of the thumb, right? So abduction, abduction, adduction. So if you have a problem with adducting the thumb, it could be an ulnar nerve injury. Now it's very tricky because when you think of the thumb, you think of the median nerve. This is a special branch that comes off the ulna. So adduction of the thumb is controlled by the uh, ulna nerve, which is the adductor pollicis. So again, when you come across these tricky little things, these are the things that they like to test on. So all of the other muscles that involve the thumb deal with the median nerve. This is just a, a good uh, situation. And yeah, that's what I said. All right, so this is from first aid. Love this, you'll never forget this. Um, I have it coming up though, we'll talk about it in a second, right? But if you like first aid, the um, sooner you start looking at this, the better. All right, so thenar muscles, right? So under the thumb here, you have the oaf muscles. Oh, the oaf muscles that all have pollicis in it as well, right? Because pollicis means thumb. So the opponents, abductor and flexor, all deal with the median nerve, okay? These are your thenar muscles, plus the median nerve is gonna innervate the lateral two lumbricals, okay? And we'll talk about the lumbricals in a second. Thumb is lateral side, right, in anatomical position. So these thenar muscles, uh, I'm sorry, these lumbricals, the lateral two are gonna be by the median nerve, okay? So if this helps, a loaf or double loaf or whatever, um, <clears throat> to remember that. Now, <clears throat> don't get tripped up because the ulnar nerve technically is OF2, but they're all gonna have digiti mini me for the pinky. Um, no, I don't think you need to know the specific branch. I don't even know the specific branch. Do you know what it is? What is the branch? For the lumbricals or the- uh... Uh, For the, for the um, TNR muscles. Like, you know, there's mm. like a current branch and then there's- digital. Yeah, may maybe so, maybe so. That the, the, I don't know, you think he sure? Do you know? No? Uh, yeah. No, they'll probably, because if you get an injury, they're going to talk about a proximal injury, right? They'll probably won't tell you, like, get a knife through the hand or anything like that. That gets tricky. Yeah, probably talk I don't know. It was just in grace. Yeah, it was in grace. So um, so. Yeah, that's the recurrent branch. There's something special about it. Doesn't the recurrent branch of the media do, like, all of the thenar muscles? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's probably good to know. Other than that, you, you should be fine. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Man, just know that part. No worries. All right, so hypothenar, oaf as well, digitized mini me, right, are gonna be in it. Now it's also gonna do the medial two, right? So digits four and five, uh, medial two um, lumbricals, right? But it's also gonna do these interosseous muscles. So what do the interosseous muscles do? They help you abduct and adduct your hands, right? Like this. All right, so let's talk about the lumbricals because this is the thing about medicine, nothing is, black and white, there's always exceptions. So when you think about the median and ulnar nerve, you always think about flexion. When you think about the radial nerve, you always talk about extension. Well, this is one of those weird exceptions because if you look here, <clears throat> the lumbricals, like we said, are innervated by the median and the ulnar nerve. They're gonna help to flex the metacarpophalangeal or MCP joint, but they're actually going to extend the inner phalangeal joints. Okay, this is the weird exception where the median and ulnar nerve uh, are gonna deal with extension. This is more, it's not super high yield, but I just don't want you to get mixed up because some of the grace questions can talk about this. So this is a point, even though it's extension, this is gonna, the lumbricals have to do with uh, median and uh, ulnar. So L lumbricals does the L like this, right? Like this. 
Okay, so yeah, we talked about that flexors, but they also have this extension. Okay, so if you look at first aid, they talk about it as well. So I just didn't want y'all to get mixed up. So there's a good mnemonic, this dab pad mnemonic. So the inner ossei, remember all the inner ossei muscles are gonna be innervated by the ulnar nerve. They're gonna do abduction and adduction. Um, dab, uh, dorsal inner ossei, do abduction, right? Spread the fingers out, all right? And then pad, palmar inner ossei, do adduction, bring them together, right? So just in case they ask you to differentiate between dorsal and palmar, dab pad. All right, and you also have, you have to have a you know a, a line to um, to uh, to to start the abduction or adduction, right? So you, they use the middle finger, and this is your line that you uh, everything abducts and adducts around that finger. Okay, try this one. Y'all are gonna get flagged on the exam for throwing up gang signs, like Benediction's hand and like, <laughs> we still do it. Yeah, it's a problem. All right, good. So Benediction attitude. Okay, so we're trying, index and long fingers extended and the ring fingers are flexed. When you're trying to, uh, make a fist, right? So you try to make a fist and the first and second fingers won't flex. So you know the first and second fingers that aren't flexing are controlled by the median nerve, right? So injury to the median nerve, okay? That's simple. Just think about it, right? If you can't flex the uh, second and third digit, median nerve. If you have a problem flexing fourth and fifth digit, ulnar nerve, you have a problem extending, uh, you have a problem with the radial nerve. Now it does get tricky because we talked about those lumbricals, but in a general sense, that works out. So look at what they're saying. Um, let's do this one first. Pope's blessing, making a fist, all right? So if you're making a fist and um, you cannot flex, this is the, what the question we just did, making a fist, you can't flex uh, the second and third digit here, median nerve injury. Okay, let's do making a fist again. Uh, if you can't make a fist here, you have an injury to the ulnar nerve. Now it gets tricky with this, and this is why I included it in there, when you do extension, because on the surface you would say extension is done by the radial nerve, but in fact, those lumbricals are innervated by the, lum, uh, by the median and ulnar nerve. So you do get injuries when you try to extend them as well. But I would bet that they would just talk about in context of making a fist. Okay, so don't get too, too caught up with that. As long as you know these, you should be fine. You okay? Come say hi. All right, here she is. She's upset now. Say hi, up, all right. Say hi. Hey, everybody, all right. Ugh. All right, let's move on to the thorax. I'll take a break in a second. Um, what they like to test in the thorax is this van bundle, vein artery nerve. You need to keep in mind the, uh, the nomenclature or how they're gonna ask this. The van runs inferior to the superior rib. So this is the superior rib, this is the inferior rib. The van's gonna run inferior to the superior rib, okay? Um, but they can also ask you, well, where would you, if you had to do a thoracocentesis to pull fluid out or whatnot, um, where would you put the needle? So since the van runs inferior to the superior rib, you wanna insert the needle superior to the inferior rib, right? Make that make sense for you. Superior to the inferior rib is where you put it, put the needle, because you don't wanna affect this van right here. I don't want to hurt the patient, all right? So they could ask it either way. So needle goes superior to the inferior rib. All right, let's do this one.
All right. So this is our this is our clue here. They're talking about paravertebral lad. Now, clinically in the ER, they do it um, um, mid axillary. Why? Because well, when the patient's in the ER, it's much easier to stick a needle and much better for the patient long term to stick a needle mid axillary than paravertebral in their back through all those back muscles. But just because it says it here, what's that going to correlate? It's going to correlate to the 11th uh, in between 10 and 12. So I'll show you how this works. Um, so technically the paravertebral is the most de dependent area, right? The, the fluid's gonna, gonna sink down there. But um, ideally, like I said, it's just easier to do it uh, mid-axillary. So if, but they could ask you any of these on the test, right? Mid-clavicular is six to eight. Mid axillary is eight to 10, paravertebral in the back is 10 to 12. So just remember six to eight, eight to 10, 10 to 12, right? So the idea is that you're trying to get this fluid that's in this dependent area, the most, you know, the gravity wise, the most dependent area without affecting the lung. So that's where it's gonna collect. Um, and that's called the costodiaphragmatic precess. All right, they like this for whatever reason. So we'll, we'll look at this too. We'll take a break in a second. All right, so what is the most important factor? So the most important one that we talk about is the diaphragm. By all means, um, the diaphragm, it contracting and relaxing is gonna cause that negative pressure to where you're able to breathe in, right? So your negative pressure allows air to in, uh, go into your lungs. But this allows us to talk about these other movements. So remember the pump handle is just gonna be anterior posterior. So technically all of these are gonna increase negative pressure, right, by expanding the volume, uh, the pressure is gonna go down, negative pressure, so you get uh, air goes in. And when you breathe out, you're incre uh, decreasing the volume, increasing the pressure, so air goes out. We'll talk about that more when we get to respiratory, but this anterior posterior, right, you can see here, this is that pump handle. Whereas the bucket handle, the bucket handle goes to both sides. So this is our lateral movement of the ribs. So the ribs are gonna go up, it's lateral movement. But by all means, the most important thing, uh, the diaphragm, it contracting and relaxing. Remember when it contracts, it makes that negative pressure. So you could breathe in and when it relaxes, it uh, pushes the air out, okay? So that's gonna be your most important one, but you wanna keep in mind these as well. Okay. Try this one. All right, good. So this is a good way of testing the dermatones, right? Because so what happens is you get chicken pox, which is varicella zoster virus, VZV. And uh, afterwards, the uh, virus lays dormant, all right? And it actually lays dormant in these dorsal root ganglion. A ganglion, by definition, is a cell body outside of the central nervous system. So these little viruses, they, they just live dormant and they're not doing anything for a while. And eventually tend to people that are immunocompromised or elderly people, would, they tend to be immunocompromised. You can get reactivation of this latent virus. And what's classic about it is it will, um, it will reactivate. And because it's in that specific dorsal root ganglion, it will go to uh, uh, one dermatome. So any question they ask you when they talk about um, this virus that uh, affects, it looks like a strip, right? It's like a single dermatome. So if you had uh, the, the T3 uh, got reactivated, the dorsal root ganglion of T3, you would see this strip. Now it'll only be on one side of the body because you have DRGs, dorsal root ganglions on both sides. So they'll say it's a strip-like fashion and it stops at the midline. 
Okay, look at this. What would y'all say this is? So nipple lines, T4. So you, I would say this is about T3. Look how it stops right along the midline. Classic, right? This is shingles, herpes zoster, okay? Um, and you get this. Uh, a lot of people that don't mount a strong response to, um, to, uh, the, to the chicken pox, they don't have a bad chicken pox uh, infection. They don't mount a strong immune response to it so they can get reactivation of it commonly. Um, that's why they say if you uh, did have a strong uh, reaction, you got really sick to COVID, you're more likely to be protected against it just because your body had a mount a strong response to it. So this is one of those classic uh, things they like to test on. It'll come up again and again, but it allows them to test the dermatones. All right, lymph nodes, everybody's favorite. All right, so this is the one that they really like to test on this one because there's this complex, this axillary complex. So whenever you get um, breast cancer, typically they talk about, well, okay, first off, what is, what is the first node called? Does anybody know? The first node that would drain from a tumor. Seminal or sentinel? Sentinel node, yes, sentinel node. So um, for breast drainage, 75% uh, goes to the anterior axillary or the pectoral and then 25% goes parasternal. So uh, the best answer here would be anterior axillary. The way I think of the lymph nodes is they're like roads, right? And they go to a central hub. So the lateral axillary, which comes from the arm, the anterior axillary, which comes from the pectoral region of the breast, and the posterior axillary, which comes from the back. A lot of times they talk about um, stabbing in the back. Where would the infection be? Posterior. They all drain into the central. This is our highway. These roads drain into the highway and then from the central, they go up to the apical, okay? You could see that here. Um, so um, anterior, posterior, lateral from the arm, drain to the central. From the central, they all go up to the apical. They like testing on that. Um, and you could see this, uh, a lot of times, you know, they have to take out the sentinel node, they, they'll take out any nodes that are affected, uh, you know, specifically with, with breast cancer, because you don't want the cancer to metastasize through the lymphatic system to other organs and whatnot. And if you have to take out these lymph nodes, a lot of times you can't get this drainage, this fluid drainage. So edema, meaning fluid buildup, uh, this lymphedema, this is caused by uh, this lymph node extraction. Okay. All right. Let's take a five minute break and we'll do pelvis and lower limb and some of the development stuff. Popeye arm, yes indeed, exactly. I don't know, it's not muscle, it's all fluid, but sure. <laughs> all right, five minutes. Um, they, the axillary is the first, first note that they talk, talk about. Um, yeah, so any sort of, reaction you get, like your body's reaction to um, say chicken pox or whatnot, you're, you're gonna, the, the, the worse you feel technically, uh, the more of an immune response you get. So the more protected you are against it in the future, the more memory cells you get. Yeah, and let's see. The diaphragm is contracting when you inhale. So that when you contract the muscle, it gets smaller. So then you get increased, I'm sorry, you get decreased pressure, right? You get a vacuum when, when you contract it. So the, the, the space gets bigger, you get a vacuum and then you get air in. And when it relaxes, it gets bigger and it pushes air out. Yeah, it's kind of counterintuitive when you think about it. But yeah, when you contract, you're inhaling. When you relax, you exhale. Just practice. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> Yes, technically, if you put dye uh, and you saw the lymph drainage, 25% of the dye would go peristernal, but the vast majority will go um, uh, anterior, anterior axillary. Contraction increases the capacity. Yes, right, for sure. 
Yeah, you're welcome. This is a trot slide. She's the best. We don't have her anymore. Yeah. So we mentioned this earlier, but in case anybody came in late, we're gonna do, we'll finish the lower limb today and the development stuff, and we'll do all of the bone synthesis cartilage stuff next weekend. We'll shoot for Saturday. That way y'all have, um, y'all have a little bit more time before you, I think it, our exam is Wednesday. So that'll be good. It'll be good to review it. So we'll cover the rest of the MSK stuff. Um, if you haven't seen some of that synthesis bone stuff, it gets a little confusing, but um, we'll walk through it next weekend. Uh, yes, 75% goes axillary, axillary, anterior axillary, that, that's together. It's called the anterior axillary node. node. Um, sometimes they just refer to it as the anterior node, but anterior axillary, yeah, that way. All right, if y'all are ready. Um, all right, abdomen. Abdomen and pelvis are very much, as you can imagine, are very much organ derived, right? So the muscles of the abdomen and even the pelvis aren't super important right now as much as the upper limb and lower limb because when you get to, when you study GI and you study uh, reproduction, y'all are gonna go, um, y'all are gonna go into that in a lot more detail. So we're just gonna kind of touch on a few things, kind of like thorax, right? You just got, we're touching on it, but the vast majority is gonna be talking about when you do organ stuff. All right, try this one. This is very high yield. Actually, this is kind of high yield. Sorry, I saw that the hernias are high yield, but we'll get to that in a second. I don't remember these, but I put this here because there's a good way to uh, to remember this. This is it, yes, ice tie. So the ice goes, uh, the tie, the ice comes from the tie. So internal spermatic fascia comes from the transversalis fascia. So as that fascia, fascia is just kind of like, a, if you think of like a visqueen or like, like a plastic layer around muscles, it doesn't really expand as much. It's kind of like the retinaculum, just kind of surrounds muscles and um, keeps everything compact. So this fascia, this fascia layer um, is going to uh, go into the, the, the gonadal fascia, right? So the transversalis fascia of the abdomen goes to the internal spermatic fascia. Internal oblique muscle turns into the cremaster of muscle and the external oblique turns into the external spermatic fascia. So just use this ice tie thing if they ask you about it. Um, yeah. All right, this is this is what I was thinking is this is very high yield. They, you know, hernias are very common. Okay, so there are two hernias you want to be concerned with in regards to the abdomen. You have the direct and the indirect, right? So they tell you it goes through the deep inguinal ring. If it tells you deep inguinal ring, you know automatically it is an indirect hernia. The direct hernia goes through the superficial inguinal ring. The indirect hernia goes through the deep and the superficial. So I, and um, let's take another picture. Yeah, so an indirect is lateral. What is super important, um, if I put, you know, 
Oh, yeah, I did up here. What's super important is this, these inferior epigastric vessels. That's your line of demarcation, okay? So anything lateral to the inferior epigastric vessel is going to be indirect. Anything medial to it is direct. Think, think of direct as it's a direct line of sight, right? It doesn't have to travel very far. It just goes through the superficial inguinal ring. Indirect hernias is lateral to these epigastric vessels, and it has to go through the deep ring and through the superficial ring. So when you talk about direct, um, it, it goes um, through the superficial ring. Typically, this is a traumatic injury, an acquired injury, so like strain picking up a heavy object, whereas indirect hernias uh, have to, are, are typically congenital, a good buzzword, um, patent process is vaginalis. If it's patent, it means it's still whole that allows the bowels and intestines to go through it. So keep those in mind, I'll get a question on that. All right, try this one. This came up on our most recent exam. If y'all are not on the clap on the, the meme page, there's like a SGU meme page. I'm going to join it. This reminds me of it because y'all saw the Bernie Sanders where he was sitting on the steps with his mask on. Somebody put Bernie's point. It's funny if you see it, but Bernie's point of where it is on the body for this. So join the meme page if you can find it. So yeah, so the, the McBurney's point is two thirds from the umbilicus to the superior iliac spine, okay? So if you look here, umbilicus, uh, superior iliac spine, anterior superior, so it's two thirds the distance, right? And that's McBurney's point. That is the point of um, where the appendix is, okay? Uh, I put this in here. I don't have a question for it, but just remember this, um, Linear alpha is going to be in, uh, it's going to be separating anything in the middle. But this arcuate line, you can define it by anything above the arcuate line, uh, the muscles split around the rectus abdominis. So half of the internal obliques will split, external obliques go uh, um, anterior to it, transversus uh, abdominals go posterior to it. But once you get below the arcuate line, all the muscles go in front of it. Um, you may come across a question in grades about that. All right, try this one. All right, so if there's a reflex, you need an afferent limb and an efferent limb, like a sensory limb and a motor limb. So when we look at this, efferent meaning motor is going to be the genital branch of the genital femoral artery. Okay, the afferent branch is what? Which one of these is afferent? A, right, exactly. Ilioinguinal. Premaster reflex, yeah. So ilioinguinal um, and then genital femoral make the testes go up motor wise. All right, and this is kind of where they lay uh, ilioinguinal, iliohypogastric and ilioinguinal kind of like they come about out of, is it muffled really? Do I sound bad, Lindsay? You know, listen. Say that again? <laughs> Does it sound bad? Somebody said I sound muffled. You sound muffled, but I mean, I can understand you, but it is muffled. Mm, I don't know why. Now give me one second, let me just reconnect these and see. Uh, um, is that better? Is that better? No, it still sounds the same. Hold on, I'm going to change it. I don't know why. All
um, how's that? through my computer and maybe move to that will be better. Sorry guys. You sound better now. All right, we'll try it this way. Um, right, okay, we did this one. All right. Just kind of just goes into the different branches. Um, okay, try this one. Right. So <clears throat> the point being, um, a lot of times uh, there's an occlusion, yeah, inferior vena cava. Um, so if you have problems with the portal vein or traveling through the, the liver, a lot of times um, you can go through the ascending lumbar. That's just a track. It's, this is a low yield question, but it could come up. The lumbar plexus nerves, um, yeah, probably so. Uh, just I think there was a slide that had them, um, but just just in regards to the the clinical stuff, um, I don't think it's super high yield, but it may be good to know. I don't want to say no. All right, and this is just a bad drawing, but it kind of just shows the uh, azygous system going through the accessory hemiazygous comes from the left side of the body, and then the zygous vein travels back up. All right, so let's look at the pelvis. Try this one. I would just know in regards to the lumbar plexus, like know what the roots are, like what roots correlate to which nerves that branch off of it. That should be enough if they do ask you questions about it. All right, so <clears throat> these muscles are going to relax to allow um, to allow uh, the, the the child, the baby, to be delivered. But the one that's unaffected is your true conjugate diameter. So this is going to come back up in reproductive. But just in case they ask you, um, you have this conjugate, this this purple line here that you can see, and then um, it's basically your anterior posterior. Okay, so just in case you want to know, another important point here is that the, the narrowest of areas is going to be this interspinal, interspinous diameter. So when they do ultrasounds and they look at the baby's head, they also measure this intraspinous distance because if for some reason you get macrosomia or the child is too large, you may have to do a C-section, okay, depending on the length of this intraspinous diameter. All right, try this one. Good, yeah, they like to test this. Uh, pubococcygeus, it makes the ring 
around the rectum. You can see that here, or sorry, a ring around the, um, yeah, around the rectum. Um, nope, around the vaginal canal and the, the um, urethra. Sorry, not the right. Sorry, I'm looking at this wrong. Okay, nope, you see the whole pubococcygeus does go around the urethra and the vaginal canal, but it also does surround the rectum. So you can get fecal incontinence with this as well. Sometimes they'll use puborectalis. That is part of the pubococcygeus. So if either pubococcygeus or puborectalis is there, that could lead to both urinary and fecal incontinence, okay? So that's what you wanna look for in that situation. All right, this is a tricky one. Try this one. Yes, both urinary and fecal incontinence. Yeah, for sure. I think if they ask, they probably talk about fecal incontinence uh, for this test. All right, so this one is opposite of what you would think. So if we have lift the left foot off the floor, how do we have a positive Trendelenburg sign? So remember that in this situation, the muscles on the right, the gluteus medius and minimus on the right are gonna help to keep the left hip elevated, okay? So if you look here, if this left uh, leg and this hip drops, you have a problem on the contralateral side, okay? So this muscle is going to, is going to be what helps to keep the hip stable. So just make sure it's kind of counterintuitive. It's the muscle on the opposite side that would be indicative here, because the muscle you're not using the muscles that you're lifting the leg, the side that you're lifting the leg on, right? So hip keep the hip stable. You're using the the muscles that are stabilized on the ground. So it's opposite, and that's called a Trendelenburg sign. All right, let's go to the, on to the lower limb. Try this one. All right, some varying answers here. So um, the one that's compromised that you need to keep in mind when you talk about the femoral head is this medial circumflex femoral uh, artery. That's what's gonna be compromised, okay? So when we look at these, you can see this is a normal structure. You could see the acetabulum and the acetabular fossa here and the femoral neck. Now, um, they talk about the Shinton's line. Again, it's kind of like when we were looking at the, um, uh, the vertebrae, right? You would expect a line to be uh, concise or continuous, right? If you have some sort of injury here, look at this line. It's messed up, right? You can't make a straight line across. And you could see this, this shortened femoral head because you had an intracapsular fracture. And these intracapsular fractures are worse than extracapsular because of the way the arteries transverse it. So the one that's compromised typically in this area is the medial uh, circumflex femoral, okay? So this is what I was saying, this intracapsular, these are the bad ones, not the extracapsular are good, but the intracapsular are the worst one because you can get compromised blood supply, okay? Avascular necrosis basically just means the blood supply is messed up, so you're not getting blood to the distal fragment, <coughs> so you can get necrosis of the tissue. Uh, and then... The branches that go off, the smaller branches, are the retinacular branches. Um, yeah, are those little arteries. But the main artery that's going to be injured is the medial uh, circumflex femoral. Okay. Knee exam. All right, you need to be able to read these on the MRI. So we're going to talk about them ACL versus PCL. Okay. This is from uh, first aid. All right, do this one.
Mm, ascending lateral, maybe that would work with that. I would definitely think they would put medial because the lateral comes into play in a little while when we talk about the knee. All right, good. So um, we're talking about, when we talk about the drawer test, we're talking about the distal fragment again, which way does the distal fragment travel? So a positive drawer sign means the tibia can be displaced anteriorly. Does it say what kind of injury? Do y'all know what? Oh, here it is. Yeah, an ACL injury. ACL anterior means anterior displacement, anterior drawer test. What that means is the ACL prevents the tibia from being able to be displaced anteriorly. So if you have an injury to the ACL, you're going to be able to move the tibia forward. Okay. Yeah, so you can see that here. This is the ACL. ACL is going to be running uh, more anterior than the PCL, but it is kind of tricky to point this uh, or to be able to locate this. Um, uh, but again, and we'll look at that in the MRI in a second, PCL is going to run behind it. So PCL is going to help prevent posterior displacement of the tibia. Makes sense. Anterior, ACL, anterior, PCL, posterior displacement. All right. So, and this is the same thing. We're just doing the tests here. And this is this is a good way I like to, to look at it. So the ACL runs, if you start anterior or sorry, superiorly, it runs from um, posterior to anterior. The PCL, if you start superiorly, it runs anterior to posterior. So if we look at the ACL, the ACL is preventing, you see if it was like a rubber band here, it's preventing you from pulling this tibia too far forward. So if you have an injury to this red line, the ACL, you'll be able to pull this tibia forward this way, okay? Same thing goes with the PCL from the other side. So make sure you could do this because they could give you this on a test. So I, ideally, you'd be able to identify the, this one's a little tricky, but you should be able to, to find it, right? So remember, let's go back one. We said that the ACL runs from, if you start superiorly, from posterior to anterior. I outlined it here. You could see the ACL uh, running. If you start superiorly, it runs posterior to anterior. Again, it's preventing this displacement, this anterior displacement, okay? So you could see the ACL here, okay? This one's a little bit clearer, right? You could see the posterior, the PCL, it's running, if you start superiorly, from anterior to posterior, right? PCL, it's preventing posterior displacement, okay? So sit with these and make sure you can point these out, okay? I'm going to find it, be able to isolate it. All right. Hope that makes sense. Try this one. Oh, in regards to T1 versus T2, uh, that's a little more difficult. Um, yeah, I don't even know, to be honest with you. It's hard to say. Oops, wait. Oh, nope, sorry, I gave you all the answer. Okay, so ACL, so this is called this unhappy triad. Typically, they talk about an athlete getting struck in the side, the lateral side of the leg. So you typically have, in this unhappy triad, you have MCL injury, an ACL injury, and either a medial meniscus or a lateral, lateral meniscus. Different books say differently, but this is this unhappy triad. So when you have one injured, you often have all three injured. And you could see this here. This player got hit on the lateral aspect. Now keep in mind, well, let's first orient ourselves. Which side's the lateral aspect? Well, the fibula runs on the lateral side, right? So the point is just like here, player got hit here, which means you stretch the, the ligaments on the medial side, right? So you tend to get an ACL injury, an MCL, and then the meniscal tear as well. So not good, now for the season. All right, just in case they ask about the bursas. <clears throat> so a housemaid's knee is sub, cutaneous, so housemaid, I have to think about this. Liz, like, so like if a housemaid's cleaning the floor, like she's further on her knees, like think about it, a housemaid versus a clergyman, like a somebody praying on their knees versus someone scrubbing the floor. Like the, the housemaid's knee 
tends to be um, higher up because you're leaning over on your knees, whereas clergyman's kind of leaning back. Um, so it's in for patella versa, okay, um, right here. So clergyman versus the housemaid's knee, just in case they ask you. And also, isn't there, oh, the baker cyst is always posterior in case they ask you about that. So just a little bit more about that. Um, now, these are going to come important. I don't think they covered this very well in, in our lecture. So valgus, remember, again, this, this is a common theme. We're going through this distal fragment thing, right? So the distal aspect. That means the distal fragment is displaced laterally. And I know there's a lot of tricks to learn this, but if you just remember this, then you can always get it right. Varus means the distal fragment is displaced medially, OK? So I have a way to remember that if y'all want it. So valgus. That means the joint is glued together, valgus, like a gum. So the joint is glued together, and then that means the lateral part or the distal fragment is lateral because, you know, if you're putting your knees together, your leg is now displaced laterally from the midline. And so that's how I remember valgus versus um, valgus varus. And then um, so you can, whatever joint it's at, just think of it that way. That's how I learned it. And just remember, you have to be talking about the specific joint. So if we're talking about the hip, don't don't think about the the knee joint. Just think about the lateral fragment from the joint, like directly distal to it. Okay. So vera means at this joint, this distal fragment is medial, so you'll get like knock knees, right? Whereas this, you'll get not you know bow leg, you know, the legs will be displaced apart. Valga outward, distal fragment outward. All right, so genu is for the knee. Genu means knee. Um, we look here. Vera means so. If we're talking about the knee, which way does the immediate distal fragment go? Medially, vera. If we're looking at the knee. Which way does the immediate distal fragment go? Laterally, valgum, valgus. Right. Same thing with the toe. Uh, if we're looking here, this is the joint of interest. Which way does the immediate distal fragment go? Laterally. Right, valgus. Which way does the immediate distal fragment go? Medially, valgus. Okay. All right. Try this one. And this is why this was the, this is the question why I don't want you to get confused with the medial uh, femoral circumflex at the hip and the knee. All right, so this is a tricky one, but if you have some sort of compromise to the popliteal artery, the lateral femoral circumflex runs on the lateral side of the leg is gonna give you collateral blood supply, okay? So keep in mind, if you're talking about some sort of injury to the head of the femur at the hip, you're thinking medial femoral circumflex. If you're talking about some sort of injury to the popliteal artery at the knee, you're talking about lateral femoral circumflex. So you can see all these branches here, but this lateral branch can help give blood supply if you get some sort of injury to the pop of here, okay? All right, try this one. So this is one of those questions where, that I was saying earlier, they could ask you two different ways. They could say, what is, how is it supposed to look or what is the deficiency after this injury? So they're saying, 
an injury to the tibial nerve, right? How's it going to result in? So what does the tibial nerve help you do, right? It helps you to plantar flex, right? So if you are supposed to be able to plantar flex and you can't anymore, then how's the foot going to look? Dorsiflex and everted. Now there's a caveat to that because the tibial nerve also does a component of inversion. There's no direct nerve that does inversion completely. The tibial nerve and the, what's the one on the front? The fibula, nope, the, what is it? The common, not common fibula, the deep fibula? That's it, right? Deep fibula, no, deep fibula. What, what are you trying to figure out again? There's a superficial. I think it's superficial fibular. I think the one you're trying to say. Deep, but deep fibular does inversion too, right? Yeah, okay. inversion. Yeah, uh, okay. it's the deep one and the, the lateral or okay. inversion is the super. Okay, so yeah, I'll clarify that. So deep fibular and posterior tibial, both are going to have a component to inversion. Superficial fibular is gonna do eversion by itself, okay? So I think I have a slide coming up, but tibial nerve, just remember, it's gonna help you plantar flex, to stand on your toes, to press on the gas pedal, right? And it's also gonna be a component of inversion, right? Moving your foot medially, like towards the, the midline, okay? Um, yeah, this is it, right? So yeah, deep fibular. And so this is, what leg is this? This is the left leg, right? because we see our fibula on the outside. So the uh, deep fibula and the tibial nerve are gonna help to do inversion, whereas the deep fibula is gonna do dorsiflexion and the tibial nerve is gonna do plantar flexion. In the smaller one, the superficial fibula, all it's worried about is eversion. So just be careful on the test if they ask you what's supposed to happen where the, or how the deficiency affected it, right? They can say, what can the patient not do now because of the injury, or how will the, how will the patient present with the injury, okay? So I think like if we go back to this question, the easiest way to do it is say, okay, tibial nerve, what is it going to do? It's gonna plantar flex and it's gonna invert. That's knocked out. So if we can't plantar flex and invert, we're gonna be dorsiflex and evert. All right, try this one. This is tricky, so be careful. Okay, so let's check this out. So this is how the patient presents. The patient is presenting with a left foot drop. So what can the patient not do? The patient can't dorsiflex. Foot drop is basically you're in a plantar flex position. So the patient cannot dorsiflex or lift the foot up because they're in a foot drop position. Which one of these does um, dorsiflexion, right? Now here's the trick, and this is why I put this on here. Paresthesia and sensory loss over the dorsum and the left foot and lateral leg. What nerve does that? Superficial, right? How can they both be an answer? Well, you have to find the branch point and they both come off of the common fibula right where the, uh, at the, the head of the fibula, right at the knee, the common fibula comes around the outside of the fibula and then branches into the um, superficial and deep fibula. So the point here is don't jump the gun and see, see left foot drop 
and say, oh, it's deep fibula, because also look at that sensory innovation. So you have to go up to the branch point. If both nerves are affected, you have to you call them where they are. The most likely uh, consequence is you call them uh, before they branch. All right. Cool. And again, if you think about this, this help this this graph, though it's simple, helps me kind of organize it. Green and blue help to invert inversions, moving the foot this way. This red, this lateral compartment helps to evert. Um, this green, which is the deep fibular, helps the dorsiflex. And tibial is going to plantar flex your calves, right? Stand on your tippy toes. All right. Foot stuff. Let's try this one. All right, got a mix of answers here. All right, let's take a look. Now, we we're talking about this flexor retinaculum. Same thing as in the wrist as in the ankle. You have this tight band around it. So if you remember the mnemonic Tom, Dick, and Harry, right? The T is for tibialis posterior. That's how they run, okay? So it's kind of a weird question, like why do they care? But it's just testing to see if you know what travels in that retinaculum. So it's, yeah, it's Tom, Dick, and very, very nervous Harry, artery, vein, vein, nerve, and then H, right? So you can see this here. Yeah, and it kind of tells you how they run. I think I have a better, pick. yeah, so look, this is that retinaculum, medial tarsal tunnel, and that's where everything runs, but they run in the same pattern, right? And you can see that here. So this is a good way of looking at it, right? This is the big toe, medial aspect. This is that retinaculum here, and you see how they run. So tibialis posterior, um, dick is uh, digitorum longus, flexor digitorum longus, and then hairy is holicus longus. Holicus is for toe, uh, big toe, right? Um, so yeah, it's just good to know that. It's a good easy mnemonic to remember. remember those. All right, as for sensory, sensory innovation, again, we talked about this earlier with the back, but um, just make sure you understand that uh, not only can they ask you you know, if there's an injury between L4 and L5, what's, a, you know, what nerve is affected, but they can ask you what are the downstream consequences of it. So L4 goes over the, um, the large toe, L5, you see how they kind of wrap around, goes through the middle toes. S1 comes and does the side of the foot, okay? So they could tell you there's some sort of sensory loss there, um, and it can correlate to that, so be careful. Compartment syndrome, this is a medical emergency. Basically, you get bleeding into the muscle, right? And I told you this fascia kind of surrounds the muscle and it doesn't expand. So if you get bleeding into the muscle, sometimes um, it can get, there can be so much pressure that it actually collapses the artery. So you can't get blood out of there. Then it's a medical emergency. What they do is they surgically go and cut the, the fascia and allow that muscle to expand and then blood flow can resume. But if not, again, a common thing, you can get this necrosis of the muscle because you're getting stasis of blood. All right, bones of the foot, right? You can see these here. This is kind of memorization, but we'll look at some of the clinical correlates. Uh, we've all uh, uh, sprained our ankle before, inversion, eversion. Typically, classically, it's an inversion injury. Remember, if you invert your foot, you tend to tear the outer aspects or injure the outer aspects of the knee. Okay, so we're gonna look at a couple of those here. Try this one. Good. I try to trick y'all and I didn't put the most common injured when it's the second most common injured, but yeah. Good, yeah. Calcaneofibular, right? Most common one injured is anterior talofibular. They make it easy. It's from the talus bone to the fibula, right? That's the one most commonly injured. 
but calcaneofibular is number two. So you can see that here, that's where the injury is, and you could track with the insertion and um, what do you call it? What insertion and origin and insertion um, are in relation, but um, yeah, those are the most two that are commonly injured, ankle sprains. For some reason, I remember a weird question them asking like, what was the lowest, like the most distal ligament? If you look here, it's the calcaneofibular. I don't know. Yeah, for some reason, I remember that being a weird question. Okay, so yeah, you can see how they kind of, everything attaches there. All right, so this gets a little tri tricky. Um, but it, it does kind of correlate to the hand, which obviously we're all animals on four legs at one point. So the, there is a correlation to the hand and the foot. But these lath muscles you can see here, adductor hollicis, flexor digitorum brevis, flexor hollicis brevis, and the first lumbricle, they're all innervated by the medial plantar nerve. Okay, So that's a good little way of remembering that, those lath muscles. Um, and then a lot of the other ones are uh, innervated by the lateral plantar. So same thing you can use here, this pad and dab to remember it, adductors versus abductors. Um, and these are all going to be innervated. As the ulnar nerve innervated the ones of the hand, these lateral plant, the lateral plantar nerve is going to innervate um, these inner osseous muscles of the foot. Right? Perfect. All right. <clears throat> um, so when you get older, some of the, so, so we'll get into this when we get into cardio, but the veins actually have valves, right? So they're like segments because you're kind of going against gravity, right? So you get to these valve points. Well, when you get older, some of these valves can be compromised. So a lot of these uh, larger veins that have valves, the valves are compromised and you get blood flow to these superficial veins. And this can lead to varicose veins. So you tend to see this in older, older people, but it's difficult, um, uh, because these uh, superficial veins get dilated and it's difficult to pump blood. But um, it, it primarily is concerned with uh, these uh, deficient valves. That we have. All right, dermatomes, these are gonna be important uh, for you to remember, specifically like L1 is the inguinal ligament. Let's see, uh, L4 is, um, is the knee and the medial side of the great toe. Um, S1 is gonna be, um, well, in regards to reflexes, it's going to be your Achilles reflex. I think I have a slide on that. But just be able to notice these. Um, I have a question. Uh, yeah, these are going to be more important, right? So dermatonal, C, um, T4 is the nipple line, T10 is the umbilicus, L1 is inguinal ligament, L4 down on all fours is the knee. S2, 3, and 4 keep the penis off the floor, right? You can see that here. Good. Reflexes, C, C5 and 6, pick up sticks, right? So biceps, C7 and 8, lay them straight to triceps. L4 is your patellar reflex. S1 is your Achilles reflex. And then the good old anal wink reflex. S3 and 4, winks galore. Oh, yeah, and we talked about pre master. L1, right? Remember the ilio inguinal is afferent, genital femoral branch of the genital uh, nerve is um, is the efferent branch, all right? So these are going to come up again and again, so it's just good to try this. All right, so this is a, seems like a weird question, but they like to test it because this deep fibular nerve really only gives sensory innervation in the web webbing part of the first and second toe. So they like to test on it. Um, it's just weird. Uh, you can see this little ye yellow area. So if you drop a knife and you don't put your foot in like right there between first and second, they like to test on it. But um, this is a good, I like this little diagram here. You see soils on the outside, saphenous is on the inside, lateral plantar, and medial plantar, right? And again, a little bit of the same stuff. So not only muscle innervation, but the sensory loss. Um, ideally, they'll give you deficits in both motor and sensory, 
but if they don't, you need to be able to identify either or. All right, limb development, last bit. Um, so, and then Lindsay's got, got some questions for you guys. Um, the main thing I want you to focus on here is what, if there's a deficit, why did the deficit happen? You don't really know, need to know, we talked about this before, the whole jargon about how everything forms. We're looking at deficiencies, clinical correlations, and what was the problem there? All right, so just some basic definitions. Sclero term correlates to vertebrae and the ribs, myo meaning muscle, and you know dermatome has to do with the skin, right? All right, probably star this one um, for some reason. They like to test on this. Um, uh, if you think of, if you used to play Sonic when you were young like me, Sonic had a mohawk, right? So anterior, posterior. I used to think they actually named it after the game, but there is actually a Sonic Hedgehog animal, which kind of sucks. I thought they named it after the game, but whatever. He had a mohawk, so you can remember that is anterior, posterior. Keep in mind, they could ask you this on the polarizing activity as well. Proximo distal has to do with this apical ectodermal ridge, and they could even ask you this dorsal limb stuff too. So just know this graph. All right, and then the main thing here I just wanted to point out is limb buds tend to form at week four. Other than that, probably won't get into too much detail there. We're gonna get into this next week. So let's just wait on that. Um, uh, try this one. All right, good. So what is this condition? Syndactyly? Yeah. Bonus points. What kind of syndactyly? Cutaneous? Yeah, right. Exactly. Because you're supposed to have 14 phalanges. So if you had less than that, it might have been osseous syndactyly. But because you have 14, you know that the bones didn't fuse. That's a little bit tricky question, but incomplete apoptosis can lead to webbing, right? Because the idea when we're a fetus, we all have webbing in our fingers, Aquaman, right? Um, but you have apoptosis, which actually forms the digital rays. So if you don't get apoptosis, it, you can get syndactyly. Um, but uh, yeah, so if it's osseous, you would get less than 14. There's 14 because of the toe. All right, and here we see here, this is uh, syndactyly. Kind of hard to tell. I mean, you can see the skin's fused, but maybe the bones are fused there too. You'd have to do an x-ray. And you can see uh, this looks like a bony fusion here. But um, yeah, so just be careful with that. Polydactyly, poly meaning extra, get extra toes stuff like that. Uh, some nomenclature, they'd like to say supernumerary extra, right? Now, disruption of the anterior posterior pattern. What could they tell you? What is this? Problem with what gene? Hox gene? Ho it could be Hox, yeah, but I was thinking- Sonic Hedgehog? Yeah, Sonic Hedgehog, right? Because remember, we talked about um, Hox has to do with more of the yeah, um, well, okay, so let's put it this way. I would, if they put both there, I would put sonic hedgehog, but hox has to do with the repetition, like, so like the vertebrae. So if you're thinking extra digits, yeah, but I think more of like vertebral problems, you can get a hox because it's like the repetition pattern. But for this, if they specifically said anterior posterior pattern, you're thinking because uh, sonic hedgehog is uh, responsible for that, right? Club foot. How do I say this, Lindsay? Wait, this one. It's, it's <laughs> I couldn't. Have, it's, I, will, I look at the nice like talipes, talipe, something like that. Okay, it's from uh, Harry Potter. I don't know. I don't know. 
whatever. But anyway, they could put clubfoot or they could put talipus quinivarus, right? So just know that those mean the same thing. This is this inversion, um, but you could get this. Um, oh, I didn't. <laughs> um, so what what syndromes did we talk about that we can lead to club foot? Do y'all remember? One of those trisomies. I believe it was Edwards. Edwards Edward, uh, rickets can actually lead to um, bowing of the legs. This isn't technically bowing. This is club foot or like rocker bottom. I guess rocker bottom feet would be a better terminology for Edwards. This is more of a club foot. Um, I don't I actually know if they're the same thing because this looks kind of like a rocker bottom foot. Um, I'd have to look that up, but yeah. Okay. All right, try this one. Make sure that you do go over the embryo section in grays, the assigned questions, because that will hone you in on how they're going to describe it. Because, you know, there, there's a lot of like layman's ways to describe these pathologies for embryo, but they're going to pick out that one phrase that describes the actual embryologic um, disruption. And so make sure that for each and every pathology, you have that one phrase that you can zero in on, this is what this is. And Gray's is really good at helping you do that because it'll describe it like exactly how it's supposed to be and find that phrase on each of the slide because that's how they're probably going to test it. All right, so one lib limb shorter than the other by definition, this is Meromelia, Amelia, A before it means no, right? So no limb development, Meromelia means deficiency. Since we did say lump, limb development starts at week four, you'd expect the Amelia prior to that, Meromelia a little bit after, right? So there you go, the fifth week. Um, a lot of times that some medications, thalidomide, I believe, can cause this. They don't usually prescribe that too much anymore. But um, yeah, so that's good to know. Different correlates that uh, form. Um, lobster claw deformity. I don't know if that's a politically correct way of saying it these days, but um, it's there. We make it up. So cleft look, cleft hand or cleft foot, um, ectrodactyly. Yeah. But again, if they ask you a question and since somebody comes in with this, the, one of the the answer choice is going to be barely of development of one or more digital rings, right? So you're saying this is the deficiency. What was the problem? Possibly what was the gene involved? On this, I don't think it's that obvious. Maybe hawks, but um, if they're talking about primarily the anterior posterior pattern, I want you to remember the sonic hedgehog is involved. Now, this is a traumatic event, nothing genetically problem, just you know, um, by chance, you get this banding. Um, if you get some sort of amniotic band that forms, you can get um, a constriction or an in, in, uh, inadvertent uh, amputation of whatever's constricted. So that tends to happen. They could ask you that piece of it. All right, lastly, this Vactral sense, uh, this is a compilation. I don't know if they know exactly why they all happen together. It has to obviously do with embryogenesis, but this Vactral stands for these, and these, uh, V-A-C-T-R-L, these don't actually seem like they go together, but just try in your brain to kind of put them together, because they'll tell you if you have any of these three, it's technically Vactral syndrome, okay? Because you know, they will tell you there's some sort of vertebral defect, anal atresia, and they also have some sort of you know, VSD or some sort of cardiac problem. And you want to key in on this as the vector syndrome. They just don't seem like they go together because it kind of composes you know, the systemic system. But just try to put this together. This will come up again. Um, but I think that's it. Yeah, that's all I got. Um, and Lindsay's going to do some questions with you guys. <coughs> Lindsay's questions aren't posted right now because she doesn't like y'all cheating and looking ahead. So um, I will post, I will compile them and post them after the review. Okay, we'll get right into it. PTA means prior to arrival. I 
I don't see any answers coming in. Okay, now they're coming into me. Okay, we have a mix of answers. But we are getting a few correct ones. So remember that anastomoses are really important because if you do ligate and artery, if you don't have an anastomosis, which is just collateral um, blood flow, then you can get ischemic damage distal to that um, area. And so for this one, this is suprascapular. So here is the anastomosis in this area. So if you um, damage the axillary artery, you see all of these blood vessels that can then um, do the drainage. So make sure that you, this is one artery that you really do need to draw out because there are different parts. Um, and then the anastomoses are from different arteries. So dorsal scapular or deep branch of the cervical is from subclavian, suprascapular sub is from subclavian, and then circumflex scapular is from the third part of the axillary. So please do know all of this on this slide. It's going to be very important, but any anastomosis um, is going to be very fair game and very high yield. So a 22-year-old brought to the ED via EMS with a gunshot wound. Yeah, all of you guys are pretty much getting this. I'll give a few more seconds for others to get their answers in. Okay. So this answer is the costodiaphragmatic recess. Why is this? Because this recess is a, is a point um, where if you stick that needle in, you're not going to hit lung. So the low inferior border of the visceral pleura, visceral meaning organ, and so it's right on the organ, and then the parietal pleura, which is on the outside. So the space between those creates a costodiaphragmatic recess. If you go in there, you have this nice pocket of area where you can drain fluid, um, air, anything that builds up in that space. So you wanna aim for the costodiaphragmatic recess. How do you do this? This, These are the different areas where you can access this recess. So mid-clavicular, mid-axillary, then paravertebral, it tells you which ribs it should be between. And so the intercostal space should be, I believe it's like, um, 11, nine, seven, respectively. Um, I know, I do remember in the Gray's book, there being a couple questions on this and it will um, spell it out for you pretty plainly of which one, which number they're expecting here. So um, you're aiming for different intercostal space depending on which area you are sticking your needle in. The 22 year old female 10 day status post appendectomy um, incision in the right lower quadrant of the abdomen and then ABX is antibiotic. I'm getting a mix of answers and I expected this. And so we will definitely talk about the difference between the two answers. Okay. 
Okay, so the answer to this one is going to be superficial inguinal. Why is it superficial inguinal? Because we're talking about the cutaneous drainage. Um, so you are looking at a an incision site. So on the skin, cutaneous drainage, it looks infected. So where is it going to drain? And then you look at the umbilicus level. And so um, right lower quadrant is going to be kind of at or below the level of the umbilicus. So we're going to say superficial inguinal here. Yeah, you guys are getting this one. I'll give you a few more seconds. <coughs> okay, so the answer is direct hernia. Um, so I it's super, super corny and simple, but when I went through this, I made like tiny little acronyms for myself. So D M I said was a direct is medial to the inferior epigastric, which is, oh, and then I L so in, oh, indirect is lateral. So it's simple, but it's effective because I still remember it to this day. Um, so anything that helps you, you can use that or you can use your own, but anytime you can make little silly simple acronyms or mind tricks I would do it because it helps you remember it even if you don't remember the concept as well you can remember your little mnemonic or whatever you came up and you can probably narrow it down Yeah, most of you guys are getting this. I think they have a couple questions in grays about this, but this is the ischial spine. So the surgeon will feel for the ischial spine and that is their target for the pedendal nerve block. Yeah, most of you guys are getting this one too. Yeah, pretty much all of you guys are getting this. Distal fragment is displayed displaced posteriorly. So make sure any and all of those pathologies that they show or injuries that they show in those lectures, the clinical imaging lectures that you can identify them both by the imaging and by the description. So this is a, just a description of it. So make sure you know those backwards and forwards. Yeah, you guys are getting this. Brady hit on this earlier. 
So the tube should be inserted superior to the upper border of the rib. That's just one way of saying it, superior to the inferior rib. So just make sure that you understand that the artery, nerve, and vein, um, vein are going to be inferior to the rib border. So remember that. GLF is ground level fall. I'm gonna put a lot in this one. Ground level fall 30 minutes prior to arrival. Um, tenderness to palpation, ROM is range of motion. There will be a couple, like maybe, maybe, maybe two, maybe three that are similar to this. This is an example of a long drawn out vignette. And then the question is very surface level, but it is, so if you know it, you know it, if you don't, you don't. But make sure that you are familiar with the articulations at each joint, major joint. But I'm kind of getting answers all over the board, which is good. So you just know you need to go back and reference that in your slides. But the answer is the fibula. So at this joint, the actual articulation is between the femur and the tibula, tib tibia. Um, and then articulation between the patella and the femur. So these three bones are involved in the joint. Fibula is, is not involved in the actual knee joint. It kind of, there's a groove right here on the tibia that this sits in, but it's not actually in the joint. Yeah, you guys are getting this one. So the big key word here is extensor muscles. So the best way to learn the muscles of the extremities is to group them into their compartments because each muscle in that compartment is going to have the same action. It's going to be innervated by pretty much the same nerve, major nerve. And so that is a really good way to help you study and to chunk this information so that, you know, you, you do need to learn each individual muscle, but if you can chunk it into the different compartments, you can narrow it down very quickly if you're stumped on the exam. But this is anterior compartment. All muscles in the anterior compartment are going to be involved in extension. So that's just another representation there. Phoebe. <laughs> okay, you guys are pretty much all getting getting this. So the distal toe, distal fragment is oriented laterally towards the other digit. So remember if it's lateral, it's going to be a valgus. And so since we're talking about the foot, it's going to be the hallux. Um, Jenny remembers the knees. And so um, remember how I remember this is that if it's a, if it's valgus, valgum, the joint that you're talking about is stuck together, which means the distal um, and is lateral. So 
it's silly, but it works. So like if you put both feet together, the, the joints would touch up like glued together gum. So you get that lateral deviation. And then if, um, then the varum is uh, medial. Yeah, you guys are pretty much all getting this. It's popliteal. No all lymph, no all lymph. And just that sentinel lymph node, that first lymph node. Um, but it's very, very, very important that you do know all of the lymph drainage. Yeah, you guys are all getting this. This should be a gimme one. Honestly, um, I don't know if they're gonna get too technical with this with you guys right now. They get technical with it with us and the how you explain where McBurney's point is. And so here it's two thirds the distance between the umbilicus and the aces. So you're starting at the umbilicus going to the aces. For us, they started at the aces and then went to the umbilicus. So the definition is two inches from the aces on the line to the umbilicus. So just know that's closer to the aces than it is to the umbilicus. Um, I don't know if they're going to get that technical with you right now, but you do need to understand where all of these points are. Um, I think they tested it or two or three of these. Um, but don't automatically assume that they're going to do the big, the big ones like McBurney's point. Um, do understand all of them so that they can throw any of them at you and be fine. Yeah, you guys are all getting this. Collection of fluid in the tunica vaginalis. Yeah, you guys are getting this one as well. If you can pull it anterior, then it's the ACL. So um, it's pretty intuitive because the anterior cruciate limit ligament is preventing anterior displacement. So if you can displace it anteriorly, then you know the ACL is damaged. I'm kind of getting the spread of answers here, which is fine. So 
So we're talking about a couple of things here. Make sure you are reading to know what the question is actually asking. That's a huge, huge thing for exams because if you, when you're reading the vignette, you can form a bias and you might try to predict what they're asking you. Make sure you don't do that. You need to get all that out of your head, read the question and just answer the question that's in front of you. Because a lot of the times when you're reading through these you'll think, oh, they're trying to get me to diagnose the patient and then they diagnose the patient for you. And they're like, okay, then they're gonna do this, but then they do that. So make sure that you are not um, putting your own biases on these questions because it'll mess you up. So the answer is sural nerve. Why? Because we're talking about um, the sensory um, distribution right here. So sensory loss, decreased sensation in the lateral foot, which is gonna be the sural nerve. So if you see this little, little sliver right here, this is a sural nerve. And then medial is a saphenous. So a bunch of you guys put saphenous, but um, um, I know the patient had pain over the dorsal foot, pain over lateral and dorsal foot, but only decreased sensation in the lateral foot. So um, make sure you are familiar with the cutaneous sensory innervation. So sensory versus muscle. Innervation is very, very, very important. Okay, that is the last one. I had a point I wanted to make with you guys, like a tip, but I forgot. I lost my train of thought. 